Good evening, everyone.、Uh, thank you all for coming today to the roundtable for the new Digital Design Forum, and thanks to everyone who's watching us on streaming platforms, Bilibili and YouTube. I'm Yuting. I'm the host today.、Um, before introducing this event, I'd like to thank everyone who participated to make it happen.、Um, a lot of our friends from Leifeng Global Knowledge keep. Following the forum on WeChat and Instagram, Weibo,、uh, some platforms. Since we just had a rough idea three months ago, it is a pretty short time to bring out this roundtable seminar. But we make it、uh, with strong support from active and kind collaborations with our guests and a lot of help from our volunteers. So thanks again to everyone. Hope you have a great time tonight.、Um, at first. Um, our three cur curators, Hu Peng, Liu Xing, and I, will introduce ourselves.、Um, yeah, let's welcome Hu Peng. Okay, thank you, Yu Ting. Hello, everyone. Good morning and good evening. Welcome everyone to our discussion tonight. I'm Hu Peng, one of the curators of New Digital Design Online Forum. Frankly speaking, I'm a little bit excited now, because the small idea about this forum finally, after two months, became a real online exhibition. And okay, I'm the co-founder of Mark to Meta project, which is an architect plus metaverse group. I'm also a cross reality designer, VR artist, and game architecture designer. I'm currently working as a game architect for MiHoYo, a, a, a very amazing company in China. And Lars, thank you all for being here. Let us welcome our other two amazing, strong, super creators, Yuting and Zhu, and Liu Xing. Uh, hello, everyone.、Uh, this is Liu Xing.、Uh, I'm I am a designer, director, and a digital artist.、Uh, currently study at、uh, Harvard University Graduate School of Design.、Um, I work on various mediums such as architecture, multimedia installations, motion graphics, mixed realities, and、uh, 3D scans.、Uh, I'm very excited to meet、uh, a lot of friends here. Uh, and there are a lot of like uh, uh, like-minded designers and artists uh, uh, in our guest list that I I've been following、uh, for many years, and、uh, it's very excited to meet、uh, all these friends. And uh, uh, currently, uh, I'm working with my、uh, studio in collaboration with Utin called Play Dot Work. Um, and we try to fuse in the digital and the physical in order to create a, a perceptual experience with spaces, objects, and uh, uh, screens. Okay. Oh, it's a little bit embarrassing to introduce myself. <laughs>、um, I'm an artist, 3D artist,、uh, install installation designer, and sound designer.、Um, I graduated from San Arc and Columbia University, and、uh, recently my my work is trying to focus on blur the boundary of the digital and the physical world, and try to put it back to the architectural space. Thank you, so guys.、Um, then. Um, what's more, we will thanks to Global Knowledge Leifeng Platform, who always support us to organize and hold the event. I'm so honored to introduce this international organization based in China to you.、Um, the Global Knowledge Leifeng is a non-profit educational organization initiated by Professor Zhou Rong from Tsinghua University, which aimed to spread professional knowledge. And information in arts and humanities, especially in the realm of architecture, we believe in daily efforts, selfless dedication, and contribution. The latest ideas could be brought from worldwide to the students and the scholars in China while breaking the language and the regional barriers.、Um, let's invite our chief editor, Global Knowledge Leifeng, the powerful lady, flower sister, to have a quick speech to us. Welcome. Thank you, thank you, Yuting.、Uh, hi, everybody. I'm I'm Flora Lee, Chief Editor of Global Knowledge Leifeng. We have been working on academic con contents translation and production for four years, and、uh, and we have over uh one uh one thousand 
academic volunteers all over the world. It is our great honor to have such a chance to organize this forum. Thank you all for coming. This forum is not possible without the excellent curating jobs of Liu Xing, Hu Peng, Zhu Yuting, and many volunteers. And, uh, and thanks to our team member, Amber, Beijia, Cai Cai, Dan Ning, Jasmine, Qifan, Yibo, Liu Jing, Zhan Yuan, Jing Lin, Si Ling, Zhi Jian, Sophia, Zi Ye, Hao Heng, Yue Hua, Tian Sheng, Yi Ran, Yi Lei, Yolanda, Yu Yang, Hao Zhou, Pei Shan, Shi Long, Kang Fu. And special thanks to Yi Bo, Yue Hua, Zhi Jian, and Yi Qun. And thank you all for your great jobs. And uh, we are very excited to, <laughs> for the following forum. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and we want to tell the audience, if you are interested in this knowledge sharing platform, please feel free to con connect with us. Okay, then we'll go to our new design, uh, new, new design uh, platform. In the past few weeks, our curators and volunteers connect with our guests frequently. We are so excited that you are interested in our new design, new digital design. Um, the new digital design forum focuses on a digital and post-digital. It is a series of events that discusses the new meaning, future impact, and a novel application of digital in design. The topics are, trans, uh, are transdisciplinary disciplinary, including architecture, art, fashion, motion graphics, business, etc. Uh, new digital design can be any design strategy or method that is not constrained in the past digital age. The participants include architecture and design professors, designers, and digital artists in practice and industry premiers. Um, then we will have four roundtable seminars about art, theory and business, an exhibition, a workshop, and article translation activities. So if you are interested in the event, please follow our official account. Today, we are having the first roundtable seminar, Digital Creators from Art, Fashion, and the Motion Pictures. The digital, the digital world opens up a whole um, plethora of creative languages and artists have, ne have never stopped seeking their narratives by exploring their ideas, methods, and materials. In this forum, uh, exceptional digital creators from all walks of life, both local and international, will offer um, a, cal a, cal a kaleidoscope into a digital sphere. From the perspectives of art, fashion, and the living image fields, the audience will explore with the artists and the boundaries and the meanings of the never defined new digital art. And today we will have sev seven extremely talented and core cool artists online with us. Um, they are Mike from CATK Berlin, standing for Colors and the Kids. Wang Jing, the artist, Louis Hanan, researcher and designer. Yang, visual artist. Liu Xing, designer, director. David Koyola, artist. And Yangbo Disrupt, motion designer and the metaverse creator. Welcome. Uh, then I'll quickly start uh, start to tell you guys the schedule of the day. Uh, we'll have two sessions with a break. Uh, in the first session, each guest will give us a personal presentation. Then we will have a short break. The second session, we will have a free discussion so everyone can ask questions and talk with our guests. Then let's start uh, with the personal, personal presentation of our guests. We start with CATK. Mike, are you ready to share? Yes, I'm going to share a screen. Yeah. So hello, guys. Before I start to speak, I'm going to show you a quick glimpse. So this is Mike from um, CATK, and which stands for Colors and the Kids, as you already said. And first of all, thanks so much for inviting us. And um, it's a pleasure to be here and show our work. And I'm going to uh, talk a bit about the studio and uh, show you 
kind of like I'm going to start with a really old project. I'm going to go to one of the newest projects just so you get a press of the of the work that we do. So and then afterwards, we will talk more about some things. So basically, Colors in the Kids, um, we wanted to have a name um, that uh, incorporated something with uh, colors because we're all big fans of um, the variety colors offer. And um, then we came with, uh, across a song from um, Cat Power, Elizabeth specifically, and um, which is called Colors and the Kids. And she talks uh, in the song about uh, that just the colors and the kids can save her. And we really love that uh, concept. So we adopted that name. And um, basically, the studio was founded by uh, three everybody else is on holidays so it's just me today doing the presentation and it's uh, elizabeth and sebastian which are the co-founders then we have uh, another partner which is Ines. she is doing the music and then we have a great team which consists of ronnie lucas and dasha which are probably watching so um and when we started the studio we always um ended our presentations with uh, there's more to explore, which we kind of like um, took as um, the gateway into the ending of a presentation that there's always um, something that, that could be added, you know, so and there's a lively discussion between us and uh, the people we're working with and collaborating with. So we always tried to, to find a level of um, a very collaborative level so that it's a vivid discussion between us and the people we are working with and it's not just um, that somebody comes to us and says like okay we have this uh, problem but more like um, like an ongoing discussion and um, i want to start with an old project which is now 10 years old uh, because that was really um, one of our projects that really initiated the studio um, globally and we had the pleasure to work with um, both Olins, um, which we met by chance uh, uh, in New York, and they really liked our work. And um, then we did some smaller projects, and then they approached us to um, with the opportunity to work on the packaging for Windows 8, which 10, 10 years ago, it was still a thing to have some packaging. And, um, was such a great project because it's also kind of like it underlines our our way of working and um, we always tried to to get more projects in that way because we had like half a year to work with them on a, on a set of images that they used for the packaging back then pentagram also uh, redesigned the, the logo for windows which before was more like a flag instead of a, of a window and what they wanted to achieve was um, that you look through the through the window and see something else. And initially they planned to work with a variety of artists, but then they said like, okay, you can probably deliver also a diverse range of images and um, we created really so many images. And in the end, uh, they ended up with uh, 10 different ones for the different versions of Windows. And it was really great to see the the work so widespread. And we used a variety of approaches and mixed media, different tools. So basically the only limitation was kind of like that they had like a brand color palette that we needed to, to stay in. So all the different images, they have a different variety of color themes. And we really love that we got away with, um, with those images and uh, that they went for it, which we saw was really brave. So because it's uh, not their standard landscape, what they had been using before. And um, so it was a bit more wild and um, seeing then the unpacking images uh, of the Windows 8 packaging was quite fun. Some people commented, whoa, that's crazy, quite trippy. And so we really like that. And I'm showing this because it's, um, you know, it's, 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 you can do great work, but uh, sometimes it's really important that, um, that you do the right job at the, the right time. And uh, that job definitely, that project definitely helped us to establish us in, in the States from where we got then consecutive jobs and also met a lot of great um, people within Wolf Olins that ventured then elsewhere. This, for example, was the, 
the hero um, packaging, the hero images for the, the release. We also created an animation for that, which comes next. <laughs> So yeah, I said it was 10 years ago and the next one is just, I'm gonna, the next one I'm gonna shorten it a bit, but um, it's just to show you how much how much work went into the, the few images we just saw before because we had like a couple of months so, and um, it was like a lot of image research and a lot of what can we do. And so it's it's just a montage of the, the process, um, the files that we work on. And there were so many seams that we explored and then refined and went back into. And we decided early on, okay, that direction is a direction we should follow on this direction, maybe not so. Yeah, you can see it's 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 so much. And in the end, always it looks quite simple, one image, but I think it's like even though maybe one image was simple to create, there were so many, so many other ones that were disregarded and uh, so many other ideas there that were disregarded just to, to get to the result. And also for such a big project, you know, you have so many players in, in play that uh, and everybody has to agree on. Quite interesting to, to work on something like this. So um, the next project is uh, it's, it's also a bit older, but it's also it's kind of like it's a it's a different it's one of our different fields that we work in, which is uh, which we call uh, which we like to call uh, new photography. You know. We're all coming from different fields in, within design, music, and art, and everything. So um, there are many interests, and photography always is kind of like one uh, that was really important to us. And um, this is for uh, local uh, spec brand, um, local classes brand that is here in Berlin. And they approached us to uh, create images for their uh, new line. And um, well, what we love about it that we can also create the mood for um, those product launches you know so and they uh, prepare the classes with uh, a special material which is called mylon which is uh, like a granular material and they uh, laser print their frames so uh, we took that material and we research, researched a bit on it and built the environments based on on the material they're using for uh, the classes so and we love that we work digitally where we can kind of like, you know, take the, the, the physical components that they really use to create the product and then um, take them for a spin and create something uh, new, but are not bound to the physical restrictions that we have. So um, for us, this is really is, uh, product photography, and that's why we call it new photography, because we're able to build the set within the computer and um, place um, the product and uh, the objects in a different way than you would be normally able uh, practically. So we really love to, to play at that intersection. You know, is it real, is it not real? And sometimes people, they ask us, uh, did you photograph that or did you? 
the CGI. And it was really interesting because for them, it was also the first uh, CGI campaign they did. So I was seeing the computer and they were like, wow, that is possible, that is possible. And I mean, and that was now like four years ago, five years ago, and the, the results are even better. And you can see already the jump like from, from Windows, you know, which was 10 years ago and the, the engines in the computer, uh, the render engines, how much they improved until today. It's always good to be able to play around, you know, digitally where we can kind of like come up with different perspectives that not don't need to put on strings in the product. And back in the day, we did this as well. You know, we worked a lot of for music and did a lot of uh, music covers, and then sometimes we built something, and then you had, to had, you had to attach all the strings to make it work practically, and then you have to retouch it. And so it's quite nice um, that you can do that now everything digitally and it looks real um another project it's like from two years ago was uh, virgin media where we worked on a campaign in, in great britain a global campaign to launch um, virgin media as a new service for broadband telephone and TV. And of course, we had to use their brand color, which is uh, oversaturated red. But it was quite fun to, to work with that. And so we came up with the concept that you have like the broadband and uh, TV and the mobile. And those three are represented as, as three uh, strings. And that one, that project is for us, for example, is one where we really built um, a system um, in software where we could easily change the the shape and uh, we had them over here for a meeting and then we had a couple of sliders because it was built in software where we could change like all the, the splines so that we got something together in a very fast and flexible way and that one represented mobile for example the one before tv and then they were all brought together but it was also nice because um it was a project that was uh, printed all over uh, Great Britain, and so it was quite fun to see this project up there. And uh, they even painted it, um, so it was quite funny that it was created, you know, in in the virtual realm and then got translated to proper paint on a, on a building. The next one is um, a research project because that is really important for us, you know, um, having the commercial projects is, is, is really nice, but we really need to do our uh, self-initiated uh, research projects because a lot of the stuff uh, that we do commercially we take out from the research projects you know and if the commercial project comes comes along then it's it's good to always to have like uh, uh, a self-initiated research project and um, where we can draw ideas from rooms for example is one that was developed within the span of like four years or something like this, because of course we always have to see when there's time to work on something like this. But it was um, a project that dealt with um, AI, you know, and algorithms and um, semi-supervised systems, how we call them, you know, where you have like a, the computer is doing like a certain part and you just feed a couple of parameters and then see where it, where it leads you. And basically that was a project about growth and I wanted to see where it could take us and visually as well and combine the different techniques. So it's always very nice to have to have a, a research project where you can just do what you want uh, after the commercial projects, because in commercial projects, there's always feedback and you have to deal with that. So it's now and then very good to just do what you feel is right. And also we create a lot of music and the music for this one. 
So it's where those fields are really coming together, you know. And um, the next one is IBM security, and that links into the, the research, you know, because uh, we've, we've been working a lot of with, with IBM over the years, and it's, uh, it's such a great relationship and collaboration. And then we start up our project with them, and, and sometimes it's just to, to explore, like, uh, overarching idea they have uh, and, um, to see where it could lead us to exploration, you know, sometimes the, the projects, our project starts with a two week exploration phase where we kind of like just have a brainstorming with the team and work on something and um, take this as an input for the, for the production work. And this is something to show you here because um, as I said, uh, exploration is so important for us. And the first clip, it's just two minutes. That's uh, how it started. Basically, we started from the idea for their security branch uh, about the Aurora Borealis, and uh, we interpreted uh, that uh, natural phenomenon and um, gave uh, design input, which is the next clip.
Yeah, we created also the music for this, so specifically um, Enos did. And, you know, for us, it's always important to give uh, uh, to give them kind of like an overall uh, feeling and that that works really well for us when we can take care as well of the music because it, it draws draws them in more and understand uh, they can understand more our feelings towards a project and we think that is that is really important because it's um yeah it gives you more than just uh, if you would just deliver a visual and especially for those exploration things um which lead then to something else it's sometimes really good to set a certain mood and we started from there and then developed the idea that the aurora would become just a very layered pattern you know and those were the the actual assets that we created then just the four of them just to show you how the process is because through the video and through our discussions we decided that um, it comes just when you need it and um, we developed such a large set of patterns and different techniques and those are just a couple also super simple gradient that was the result from the first explorations which was used throughout the grand system the next one is also a research project and here i'm going to just show you a couple of stills um, you can see the the whole project on the website but the film is five minutes and um, this is something we just finished uh, this year so as I said, we love to work on, on research projects and there was a project um, about liquids, about um, heating liquids and um, bringing them to a different form and how they move and how it behaves and how it works with different shaders, different materialities. So and it's, it's really nice to watch, you know, it's kind of like a meditation because it's five minutes long and um, and also the videos I think is a bit choppy through the video chat, so watch it on our website. Watch it in 4K. It's quite nice. Also created sound for that one. We really love the moments, the moments in between, you know, what, what happens with the forms and when when they merge with the liquid, it's kind of like the music that is sometimes in between the, the actual notes. As Miles Davis said, so it's also kind of like what happens between. Yeah, it led to really great visual results. And that is the last project, which is uh, also the latest. And um, it's probably for every studio, it was kind of like um, a bit tricky to, to adjust to the pandemic because um, since over a year ago, we all work remote. And um, but it also led to uh, new ways of working. And um, we had the pleasure to, to collaborate with uh, TV2 in Norway and uh, Bold Scandinavia as an agency. And Bold did uh, the rebranding for the TV channel. And they asked us to work on. The eye dance, the eye dance are kind of like short clips that play between uh, advertising or before the news comes in or between program. So, and um, the good thing was that we got a really larger team together. You know, we had a couple of people from all over the world to work on this. And um, yeah, because we were so experienced now working with over one year remotely, that we said like, okay, that's that's great. We can we can use that to our advantage. And, concept for those items was kind of like um, to always bring two different uh, views together that are forming like a, a unique perspective. So those two belong together, you know, so basically we shifted always from one scene to another and tried to have a nice idea. Like the cloud berries, which are very, very typical for, for Norway. This is shifting to a car. So we wanted to make sure that the that the viewer that they get a connection, but it's not always so obvious, you know. 
Here we have an egg and then we have a pancake. Some shapes forming. Dinosaur, a lot of shapes. Oslo Opera. Belonging to that one. It's a spider web, which is fast. Some strings in Ireland. Geometry, which actually turns to sport. And here's the short wheel of the items. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Mike. Thank you so much. Thank you for the amazing presentation. Uh, although this is not my first time to watch your work, it's still like super, I am feel super, super excited to see this like unbelievable, fabulous materialities, the colors, the forms, everything that you make. And I, I, I don't know what, 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 to, what to express my feelings. Uh, and we ha actually, we have already uh, received a lot of questions from our audience, but we will st uh, start our question and answer session in the, sure. in the second session. Please wait for a, a little time. And let's move on to the second guest, Wang Jing. Uh, Wang Jing is a well-established uh, well artist and seek unique creative expressions in the past 20 years with a sprawling range of art uh, with artistic forms such as operas, drama, dances, and musicals. Uh, welcome, Wang Jing. Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you immediately to join this blind forum um, because I'm the theater practitioner and also work in the theater and performance as a scenography and director. And uh, I graduated from the Zoya Central School Speech and Drama in the uh, Zoya Central School of Speech and Drama in London. And now I'm in the Cambridge University. My research is in the digital space and uh, performance. So today, I um, my presentation will focus on, so just a moment, I will show the, just a moment. Yeah. Okay, today I, I would like to share the new media in the theater performance and the installation. And uh, because in the, during the limited time, I, I can't share all, all of them. So I just uh, uh, choose some of the artist uh, and the director and uh, just to give some idea about what had happened in the theater performance arts and installation by the new media language. And so firstly, I would like to give some uh, um, short uh, information about the historic background in this area, what had happened in the uh, theater and the performance. Um, 
So if we want to talk about the organize, uh, well, if we want to talk about the new media in the performance, we should uh, start from the wagoners. Wagoners, the total of arts in a in the mid and late nineteenth century, and uh, because uh, you know the digital performance into the theoretical tra uh, trajectory, which begins with wagoners' total of the arts, and then we can move to the twentieth century avant garden, and then we can see the in invasion of the digital and cybernetic technology happen, which is uh, in the post Second World War period of the late 1940s. And because this is like a mm, historic line, then we can know what, uh, what had happened in the technology and also how to influence in the theater and the performance arts. And from the middle, late 20th century modern modernism and then we go to the intervention of the world wide world in the early 1990s then we come to the 21st century because in the theater art theater arts performance arts we will we call it is a post drama period so first uh, the artist i want to um, introduce uh, sophie and Joseph Swoboda. And actually he is an architect and, uh, and also he's a philosopher uh, and because uh, he said architect as a scenography. Um, Joseph Swoboda was a Jack's artist and a scenography and uh, he considered himself a scenographic, scenography rather than a designer, and uh, we can we can return to the historic moment because uh, he chose to uh, show a more holistic architecture, no naturalistic approach to design. His multimedia installation. Letter Macquick and uh, Polly Cara present on the occasion of the Expo 58 in Brazil. Then we can know um, in the history what had happened in the theater, in the performance. The artist used a new media. So, and uh, these productions um, introduced the combination of the live actor you can see in the in the 1958 this new media has happened in a stage and the com combination of the live actors and the filmed projection projections this is live actor and also the the projections and the scoreboard is also responsible for introducing modern technologies and materials such as the plastics. This project is uh, present in uh, Milan and uh, 1989. And in that period, the swallboard used uh, projection and lighting and different material as well to present the theater story. And uh, yeah, so you can say um, Swoboard uh, created uh, one of his best known special efforts, a, th a three dimensional pillar of lights. Um, yeah, then this, 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 uh, this production is uh, come from the Gerda's famous uh, pieces, which is uh, Faust. So I think uh, many, many audiences will know about this. Then we can come to the Nanjiang Pain and uh, technology as performance. And uh, why I share his uh, pieces? Because uh, and uh, he's a very, very important artist for the performance arts and also a significant influence to the theater arts as well. 
Mm. As people know, and, and uh, he is a he he was a Korea American artist. He worked uh, with a, a variety of media and is considered to be a founder of the video video arts. And uh, he's credited with the first use of the term electronic superhighway to describe the future of tele communication. So, firstly, we talk about his pieces. And uh, TV Buddha is a video sculpture with the first uh, produced in 1974. In the work, Buddha statue watches an image of its, itself on a TV screen. The TV's image is produced by a live video camera and trained on the Buddha statue. The work was produced to a fill gap in the 1974 exhibition at Gallery Borneo in the New York. So then we can talk look at uh, his other pieces is a TV garden and uh, in the 19, 1974 his pieces uh, use uh, lots of technology and uh, new media and uh, his pieces definitely influenced lots of the European theater artists so this is why he's really really important for us and uh, this is why I want to share his work in, in today um, and also, this is another one. It's like Trollic Super Highway and use um, con constructed of 336 te te televisions and 50 DVD players, 3,750 3, feet of the cable and uh, 575 feet of the multi-colored non-tubing as a testament to the way the media defined one man's understanding of the diverse nation. And the next artist I want to share the very well-known American theater director and also his uh, act act and also playwright and uh, Robert Wilson. Um, I think maybe people know him and because he did lots of project in the theater and also installation as well. <clears throat> and Robert, Robert Wilson is American experimental theater director and playwright. Sometimes he also performing as well. And also, he he has also worked as a choreographer, uh, performer, painter, sculp sculptor, video artist, and sound and lighting designer. And um, his influence on the theater has changed the understanding of understanding of what contemporary theater might be. One of the most influential and acclaimed artists artist in the world and bring his own unique approach to the material. And uh, I want to share very important uh, his uh, uh, new media languages about art, uh, lights because uh, the um, manipulation of lights is essential to the Wilson's uh, scenography. He says light is the most important part of theater. How it reveals object, how object change when light change, how light creates space, how space changes when light change. I paint, I build, I compose with light. Night is a magical word. So we can see his production. This is um, Odyssey. And which premiered in 2012. You can see this lights is a very uh, digital lights equipment to uh, painting on the stage. And also he used some of the 
and projection on stage as well. Um, so next artist, I want to share the Lauren Anderson's uh, uh, works. And uh, because uh, her digital music is as performance. So, and Lauren Philip Anderson and uh, is American avant-garde artist and composer, musician, and uh, film director whose work spans performance arts and uh, pop music and multimedia projects, initially trained in the violin and the sculpting. Anderson purpose of a variety of performance arts projects in New York during the 1970s, focusing particularly on language, technology, and visual imagery. She became more wide widely known outside the art world when her scene or oh Superman reached the number two on the UK single chat in the 1981. And also his opinion in the electronic electronic music because he she is very um be good at using electronic equipment and um, new media to present uh, her work by musical language. Um, we can say this piece is, uh, is uh, premiered in 1983. In that period, she used the, um, you know, the, uh, he, she, she shares, when I began to write the United States, this piece is, and I thought of it was a portrait of the country. Gradually, I realized it was a really a description of any technological society and of people attempt to live in an electronic world. And in that moment, she thinking, yeah, we, we start to live in an electronic world. Because for the theater artist and um, uh, performance artist, we are not just to use the uh, new technology, but we're also thinking how to use the new technology to present our life. So this is why today uh, my presentation is not just to focus about the new media language, it's also focus about how the new new media language change our life. and. Uh, um, because the theater people is always thinking about humanity and uh, it's it's about uh, the physical world and also the new the technology as well um and uh, she is a very amazing artist she she's amazing artist this is uh, uh, her last theater project is a VR project which premiered in the Venice film festival last year no oh, yeah uh two years ago yeah on chalk room and uh, chalk room is a virtual reality work by by uh, lauren anderson and another taiwanese artist is uh, um chin Chen huang in which the reader films through an enormous structure made of the words the words, the drawings, and the stories. Once you enter, you are free to roam and fly. Words seal through the air as emails. They fall into dust. They form and reform. So this is uh, about the Lawrence pieces. Next one, I'm on, I would like to share the robot, Robert Lapage. Uh, Robert Lapage is a uh, is a, for him the space and projection as the main language, and uh, he is a well known. He's well known the French Canadian theater maker, and as a writer, director, and performer as well. 
1994, he founded X uh, Max Chen, the company, the theater company. And uh, this company is focused on the multi multidisciplinary production. And his work com combines sedu seductive, seductive storytelling with the visual transformation. Um, this piece is needles, uh, needles, needles and opium, uh, which uh, premiered in the 1981, 19, 1991. And uh, this is uh, inspired, is, inspiration from the life of John Cocteau. Um, it first seen in 1981, the original production was uh, legendary, give a uh, entire in generation of theater, a new version of what theater could be. For example, um, um, Robert Lapage used to use the space to present a story. In this pieces, he uses some, it, just a box and the box can reserved in to different angle and also use some the new media language, for example, the, the projection and the lighting as well. And, uh, and using the, this, in, that, in that period is a really uh, new technology in the theater. Um, so he has reimagined it for the next generation from these pieces. And, um, in a production that still profounded asserted the train source of the Lapage's theatrical genres, his unique gift for the matching sinuous image to, to the uh, contemporary source. You can say the performers is follow the space and turn around and also uh, con connected to the image as well. And also they had used some of the film, the projection in these pieces and uh, connect to the uh, life, life pro projection as well. Okay, next one, I would like to share uh, the Wooster group. Um, it is an experimental theater company. Um, the Wooster Group is a New York-based experimental theater company known for creating um, numerous original dramatic works. It grandly emerged from uh, Richard Sch Schickner's The Performance Group during the period from the 1975 to 1980 and took its name in the 1980s. Um, in this piece is, is a Hamlet. I think everybody know about Hamlet is a Shakespeare's uh, Will Lowen's pieces. And, but in these pieces, uh, um, they mixed uh, lots of new language, for example, um, the director uh, was recorded. They recorded the live performance from the 17 camera, the camera in the different uh, space to to live record the performance in during the during the the, the performance as well. Um, and uh, the and aid it into a film and to show a special event for only two days. Um, nearly 1,000 move, movie house across the UK. I Actually, this is very important pieces in the theater performance history because the, in that period is 1964, they use the new technology and new media to present the Shakespeare's uh, 
pieces, uh, for example, the Hamlet, this is really, really first time to do it. Um, then I would like to share, yeah, I think uh, everybody maybe know this artist, uh, style uh, and the body as a media. Uh, as a performance artist, uh, um, he, he used to use his own body as a as perform performance and also as a media as a material, and we can see and um, and he is a Cyprus-born Australia performance artist whose works focus on, focus heavily on extending the capability of the human body. Until two thousand seven, he held the position of the principal research fellow in the performance arts digital research unit at Nottingham Street University, England. His servant father, his research at uh, Curtin University in Western Australia. Um, his performance often involve uh, robot robotics or other related modern technology integrated with his body. You can see a lot of the uh, robot equipment and connect to his body and also use this language to present his performance. And this piece is which premiered in 2015. And uh, this is the internet in label performance that explored the physiological and aesthetical experience of a fragmented, uh, distracted, and uh, involuntary body. Um, this is very, very important pieces uh, from him. And also, I think maybe people know about another pieces is from Ear. This is a, a, a recent uh, production by him, the uh, Ears on Robot Arms, a Body on Robot Arms. You can see. Actually, and uh, he is a very important artist in the 21st century because uh, he um, explore a lot of the new technology uh, in the performance and also um, use the robot AI and uh, um, different uh, techno technologies, language uh, into his uh, uh, performance. Um, another one I would like to share it's a very famous, very well known the Australian dance company and Trunk Move. And uh, this is a um, new media's age. I think um, people maybe know his work well, well. And uh, because they use the body and connect to the data and also use the, the, the projection uh, to present uh, their performance uh, as well. Um, Check Move is an Australian contemporary dance company. The company's work is diverse has, and has included stage, new media, and installation works. Their fascination with new technology and contemporary method came to the character, characteristic and the com company's work. Works like uh, this one, the Mercial Engine, which is premiered uh, 2010, is around uh, 12 years ago. Actually, we can see and uh, um, new media in the theater has happened many, many years ago, not just recently. Um, this, this piece is we can see the creation of the set and in which projection responded in the real time to the dance 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 movement. Another word such as uh, um, this one. They use the data as well to connect the body movement. And also they use some space to 
to create the DAOs as well. And uh, yeah, we can move to Ivan Hoff. Uh, I think uh, this uh, he is a very low end the, the European artist, uh, and uh, he used the projection. And for him, uh, the projection become the material reality. We can see his, his recent. Um, this is uh, Anton. Antoni Oni project, uh, which premiered 2009. And uh, uh, Ivan Hoff is a Belgian theater director, known as his uh, off Broadway avant garde experimental theater production. Um, and uh, in this project, I would like to share and uh, simultaneously performed and uh, filmed. So firstly, you can see they have lots of leaf filmed in the theater. It's not like a traditional theater because they are filming, filming the performance and uh, leaving performance as well at the same time. So this is like a mixed language together. Um, today, because the uh, I just have limited time. I can't show too much about virtual virtual space uh, in the performance arts, but I just uh, sh share the new media in the performance arts. And uh, maybe next time I can show more about a virtual space in the in the performance arts. But now I, I want to share these pieces. Is about uh, you can you can see audience can see all the stuff at the same time as well, and. Uh, the multi perspective, multi perspective, uh, is like a duo shi jiao. It's like Chinese language, duo shi jiao. Um, but normally in the traditional um, theater, we just have the one one angle, one view. But uh, in his pieces, we can use different view as well. Um, multi perspective pro provide uh, intim intimate and uh, with uh, with sorrow insight into the lives of the key characters dissipated in the films as he rested with his emotions in Jago and his passion and research for the truth. So next one is uh, his piece is about um, Kings of War. This very important piece is from this director. Um, Kings of War is a combines uh, and Henry VI Henry V and Richard III into a single explosive play about leadership. All this, all these kings come from the Shakespeare's uh, play. And uh, in this piece, they want to talk about uh, leadership. And Shakespeare's king are a political leader who come face to face with the ultimate responsibility. They must take the life or death decision of whether to go to to go to war. Shakespeare draw us into the psychology of the rulers, while also revealing the mechanization of their countries and adversaries. Kings of the War play lays bare the mechanism of the decision making in time of the political crisis crisis, expulsion, the digitome between national interest and self-importance. Um, so this is uh, about, uh, I, um, I would like to share uh, the new media in the theater performance, arts and installation. And uh, the next uh, one I would like to share, this is, uh, yeah, this is his pieces. So next one, I want I want to share some pieces from myself and my uh, design studio, because I set my uh, set up my design studio in Cambridge in uh, two thousand fourteen. Uh, my studio is focused on the performance arts theater project and uh, installation as well. And uh, recently, I I I use the new technology in my pieces as well. I would like to share some part of. This is uh, the dance and I designed uh, um, in the 2019. 
which premiered in the Shenzhen Grand Theater. We use the digital lighting equipment. You can see this one and also the light, the digital, the projection as well, and connect to the contemporary dance. And uh, this, this is my very um, ex wonderful experience to new, use a new media in the theater. Um, so um, it's really interesting because sometimes the, the performer is, uh, especially for the Chinese performer, they are uh, not uh, used to the how to keep dialogue with the new media. Because for, for theater person, we, we can't just uh, thinking about uh, technology by one side. On the other side, we should think about uh, the body, the physical body, how to let them to keep dialogue with the new technology, new media as well. So this is a very, very um, important uh, question for us. Um, and uh, yeah, yes, we use a, a live pro, uh, projection to camera the performer and then rejection on the floor as well, the, on, on the law as well. This is the opera and the John Robbins opera, which premiered in the 2019 and in the Berlin State Opera House. Uh, this is a very uh, amazing experience for me because we also use the uh, projection to connect to the physical space and uh, present the opera. Uh, it's really interesting. It's still very challenging for the opera singer as well. Um, but uh, anyway, we, we still want to try different way to present in the theater space. And uh, I would like to uh, sh just a very short to share my experience on the VR uh, in the during the pandemic in the UK uh, because I work with my team, the Hu Pong, and who is all, he is also a very good designer and architect. Uh, we work together and uh, and um, my team as well. But this is still not a premiere, and we're still working on it. Uh, I just use this um, uh, fa famous Chinese poem to, to present the story by VR language. I hope they will, they will premiere in London soon because we're still <laughs> suffering the pandemic in, in London. So this is another one. I'm working in the, the VR and the end of time. And I'm so sorry, I can't show the final product, uh, the final image because we're still working on that. So uh, this is my experience uh, recently. So I would like to share it to everybody. And thank you for your time to listen. <laughs> and uh, because my presentation is not just to share my uh, project, is also I want to share something about what had happened in the theater, the performance arts and the installation by the new media language. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Wang Jin. Thank you so much. Actually, we have a very good news is that right now we have over uh, 13,000 audience join to see our streaming. And that's a really big success. Um, and uh, I want to let uh, our audience know that we will have Yang, we will have Liu Xing and David Koyola and uh, Yangbo and Louis. And the next one, we will welcome Yang. He's an uh, acid CG artist, takes daring ventures into experiments with his unique plants and the central character uh, relates the characterization challenging the boundaries of type and meaning of reality and the virtuality. Welcome. Uh, hi. Mm. Hi, my name is Yang Rui. It's nice to meet you guys. Yeah, uh, I'm Jia Jun. I'm his friend. And uh, we also collaborate some work before. Uh, because Yang, he doesn't speak English, so I'll translate uh, for him today. Yeah, so it's nice to uh, meet you guys and talk to you guys. So we'll uh, share our screen. Uh, wait a second.
Uh, okay, I'll start from the uh, introduction. Um, Yang Ri is a 3D visual artist. Uh, I've known him since last year, and uh, most of his work are focusing on um, 3D visual art and digital virtual photography, 3D scan, uh, etc. He's very young and uh, has lots of passion. Um, and he also collaborated with uh, lots of magazines and mediums. Um, he's done lots of design and uh, uh, concept uh, images for them. Uh, he's really interested in uh, creating all kinds of images uh, that are inspired by uh, plants and uh, creatures. Um, so we'll go through and introduce all the work uh, he has done. Mm, okay, so next page. Uh, I'll, uh, he'll, talk, uh, he'll speak in Chinese and I'll just translate for him. Okay. Okay, the first theory is uh um, he combined like a mimic uh, botany and digital images. Um, like these two elements are like main ideas uh, of his uh, work. So uh, the first, um, he, he like to show uh, some inspirations, like where his idea came from. Uh, so yeah, these are some inspirations. 嗯，就自然植物和微生物的话，就是也是我在一直在做，它包括是会有一些很多共生的一些结构在里面，这也是我平时是嗯一直在观察的一些内容，包括它会有很多这种丰富的颜色和一些就是很很复杂、很就是随
就他也是一个，就是我一直在拟拟态共生，也是一个我在做的一个状态。就他会有很多这种结构性的一些嗯衍生在里面。Uh, this series is like, um,、mm, it's kind of like a bonsai, like, um, 就说盆栽怎么讲？植物。Oh, it's like inspired from the plants, uh, and the, something, something like、uh, the plants and the creature, uh, other life, like they live together and, uh, uh, just stay together. 嗯，对，就就是它结构上的话，也是我，嗯，经常会有一些这种不同的一些颜色，因为我对其实对颜色也是相对来说比较敏感的，我也会用很多这种颜色特别丰富、很对撞的一些颜色来去展示我这个整个系列的一些内容，包括会有很多这种大胆和夸张的一些结构材质在里面，有一些这种可能会很随机的藤蔓，因为我其实在做创作的过程中是一个很随机的一个过程。Uh, another, uh, another point I'm interested in is the the color of the the, the color because you can see in this project, uh, I experiment with the color and、uh, also I exaggerate the shapes to, uh, to make uh, I use lots of like、uh, some high saturation like high contrast color, uh, in the image and、uh, another thing is. I uh he uh explored lots of uh he he uh he's done lots of experiments on the shapes. Um, he used lots of ex uh very uh strong shapes and、uh, exaggerated shapes to compose the、uh, uh the image. 嗯，在这个系列中，我也会去做很多，就是结构上，包括体积很丰富的一些结构和一些这种，嗯，就材质上会是很多不同的一些状状态和感觉，这也是在我平时的生活和过程中会有这种不同的。哦、oh, ，Yeah, it's all this also, uh, came from, uh, inspired, uh, from, uh, my life, like, uh, it's come from the inspiration I mentioned before. Um, so these are more focused on the structure and the material. I've done also、uh, experiments based on that. So we can see the structure is more complex, and the materials also. Yeah. Um, that is, it is actually in some degree, in some degree, to say. 会有很多这这种就是枝枝干或者一些结构上的一些这种共生关系，包括它会有一些这种嗯子集的一些关联性在里面，就是它它们都属于一种呃细胞的一些共生关系。嗯、mm -hmm. ，It's also interesting the plants, the structure of the plants, and he also thinks there are some 呃、uh, some creatures like cells. There are a hierarchy or there are a、uh, There's 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 a structure inside of it. Um, can you explain the relationship? Yeah, can you explain the relationship? Relationship, uh, structure, structure. In the structure, there is a relationship. Uh, relationship is basically like animals and plants. Because they themselves are actually related to the nature. But I I think they are actually related to the nature. But I think they are actually related to the nature. But I think they are actually related to the nature. But I think they are actually related to the nature. 嗯，就是结合在一起的一些关联性，就是骨骼和一些细胞在其中。嗯、mm -hmm. um, ，He's really interested in in the idea idea. Uh, like I'll translate. Uh, in Chinese it's 共生 I translate like live together. So, like in the nature, there are some micro uh biotics, and uh, there's a like very little creature uh live live together with the、uh, plants. And、uh, he'd like to show this relationship and、uh, this idea also in his work, so we can see there's a、uh, the structures kind of like plants, also like a skeleton or it's like bones.、Um, and、uh, there are some、uh, there are some parts that are like cells. So he also want、um, use his work to represent this uh, uh, this kind of relationship. In the real life.
嗯，就可能可能是也有一些这种骨骼关系和一些这种支脉的关联性。我我其实觉得就是，嗯，可能世界上的一些可完整的一些完美的东西很多，但我其实想打破这些关系去做一些很随机、很就构成类的一些这种，嗯，可能在我每天意想不到的一些东西。Okay, <clears throat> so in this image, you can you can really tell there are structures like bones, like a relaxed skeleton. It's like uh, lots of bones. Um, uh, his ideas. There are lots of things in real life. They are uh, um, they are complete. They are perfect. But I would like to show the side of incomplete or imperfection. 就是说不完美的人，之后是是啥来着？是是，就是就是随机成，嗯，是有很多不同的。哦，呃 ，also also it represents the diversity, uh, the 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 diversity of the relationship of the nature. 其中就是一些，是就就这样看。嗯，你直接说地方。嗯，也之后的话就是一些延伸的一些图，就是在创作的一些内容。哦，这个就是呃、uh, ，this image also 嗯、uh, ，has 呃、uh, ，this has also have the same idea but developed、uh, like 呃、uh, other forms um based on the idea live together and the idea we mentioned before um he also created this images. Based on this idea, and develop more complex forms. Yeah. 嗯，第二个我可能要分享的就是，它是一个与嗯杂志之间的一个合作，包括其实我在平时的话也比较喜欢去用一些嗯三 D 扫描的一些呃，就是三 D 扫描的一些技术来去嗯还原一些实景一些内容，来去在嗯数字媒体之间来去制作。Okay. Um, this theory, uh, he like to share is um a collaboration with a magazine Wonderland. Um, in in the uh um in this theory, he used a technique three D scan. He uh in daily life, he's also uh like to use uh three D scan, uh to record and scan uh the real object around him and from the daily life. 嗯，在在其实，在做一些这种，嗯，可能稍微偏向商业一些的东西，就是作品之类的话，可能会觉得三 D 扫描其实这这样技术来去辅助我去表达一些东西，我可能更像是在，嗯，在这个创作中是一个，嗯，虚虚拟摄影师的一个身份去来诠释我这这组杂志片。Yeah, in in this、uh, project is kind of like. A、uh, commercial object because、um, I want to share this because、uh, I think a significant point is in 3D、uh, scan. I can、uh, be the photographer to、uh, to place a camera where、uh, anywhere I want.、Uh, so so it's I'm also like a photographer in this. Oh, this is a this is a short video. Um, he also uses a three D scan to create、uh, create it. <laughs> That was the second video.
在在这些，在这个项目里面，其实我是会让模特去摆一些这种很夸张的一些造型或者是姿势，但其实，在三 D 里面，三 D 里面可以去转换一些不同的角度角度来去做一些可能在一些静态片里面就是实现不了的一些各种角度的合成。嗯，对，呃 ，when I scan this and when 呃、uh, ，like in the 呃、uh...。When I shoot the model and or, or scan the model, I ask the model. To,、uh, he asks, he asks the model to、um, do some、uh, poses that not uh, like um, uh, do some special poses. And、uh, when is when the model turn into the three D? <laughs> when the model turn into the three D. And uh, um, I can place the camera, and I can achieve achieve some images, uh, that we cannot achieve in uh in two D, like through the through the traditional uh photography, uh. So yeah. 嗯，在在做制作就是扫描或者是一些这种商业的一些片杂志片来说的话，我可能会嗯和我之前做一些其他项个人项的一些创作有所不同。他们嗯整体可能会用一些比较简简洁的一些长背景或者是一些空间来去诠释嗯以人物人物为主的一个视觉手法来去制作。呃、uh, ，Yeah， so in this image, I um. I did some like more、uh, simple stuff. In case I forgot to show, you can come back to show. Oh yeah, yeah. In this, in, in this image, I'm, I'm, uh, I tried something different than before. Um, not that complex the uh, uh, scene and the stage. In this, I I create a clean, very clean and simple background, uh, and uh, to do the contrast with the with the three D scan figure. 在在场景中的话，我也是可能是有一些在跟我以前创作中是有一个嗯很很大的一个共同点，是我也会去做一些这种。很随机，很就是 freestyle 的一些感觉的东西在里面，包括可能会把一些嗯贴图贴到柱子上，或者是一些残碎的碎片混合在我的这个就是模特片里面，就它是一个嗯让我觉得是一个很享受的一个过程。嗯、uh, ，In this, uh, in this image, in this images, I, uh, I try something, uh, I. I I take further steps and try something new. Like I place some maps on the uh on this column and on this pillar, and、uh, I use more of these fragments to compose the to compose the scene. In this process, uh, uh, he he really enjoys the, this process to <coughs> to compose this. 嗯，他就是大家能看到，其实，在一些就是嗯人人物上也会摆一些这种，可能类似于有一些嗯宗教一些宗教类的一些嗯形象，可能他也会有一些像雕塑一样的一些感觉在嗯人物后面，也会有一些这种很静态的姿势，其实也是跟我也比较感兴趣的一些这种宗教体系里的一些这种雕塑有关。Uh, in this image, is kind of like related to the religion, uh, sculpture or the or the sculpture in the religions. Um, is that's also a point he's interested in. Um, 第第三个项目的话，就是嗯，我分享的也是一个比较个人向的一个嗯创作。嗯，其实它也是一个跟我嗯，可能一直喜欢的息息相关的一个嗯品牌为主吧。它嗯，是什么品？呃，就就是一个杂志，杂、嗯、那个。嗯，哦、oh, ，it's it's also inspired. 呃、uh, ，this actually inspired from the fashion uh brand. 呃、uh, ，it's a deconstruction of the machine. 嗯、um, ，yeah, it's also what he interests in this.
So we are sure this one. So the inversions from uh, this uh, this brand. Kiko就是品牌，它其实我一直喜欢它点是在于它会有很多这种运动元素和一些工业机械传统内容的一些结合，就是也是我一直一直比较关注的一个品牌。其实我对他们这个颜色和材质的一些质感，嗯，让我就
结结构上也会有运用一些之前所说的我比较个人喜欢的一些三 D 扫描的一些技术来去跟嗯我这这一项的一个创作去做一些融合，它会有一些就是很夸张、很不可思议的一些这种嗯表演形式，包括可能会有一些这种车辆的一些堆积，就是有一定的升级。嗯。Yeah. Um. In in this images, he also use three D scan, like mentioned before. That's what he is really interested in. Uh, it gives uh the the work uh a kind of uh exaggeration, like uh like the car stacked together is yeah. Uh. So that's that's all for today. Thanks for. Uh, listening and really nice to sharing this with you guys. Yeah, well, well, we will talk to you guys in the Q and A section. Thank you, thank you for some. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Yang, and thank you for Yang's friend. Um, oh, yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> Can I ask your name? Uh, Jia Jun. Yeah, my name is Jia Jun. Yeah, thank, thank you, Jia Jun. And yeah, yeah. Uh, and thanks for sharing so many amazing projects and the behind the scenes secrets. We love to see these secrets, actually. <laughs> um, yeah, we will move on to the next artist, Liu Xing, and he will introduce himself. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, I'll share my screen. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Qin Liu, uh, and you can call me Xin, if it's helpful for the pronunciation uh, under my name here. Um, I'm a designer, director, and a digital artist. It's a such a great honor and pleasure to be here virtually to give a guest presentation to share my work to a lot of talented designers and artists uh, around the world. Today, I would like to have a dialogue around the idea of digital. A world. Wait, my, my video is stuck. Uh, okay. Uh, today, I would like to have a dialogue around the idea of digital, a world composed of digital and physical. I'll talk about why this title later. Uh, today's session will be quite interactive, so I hope you, in, you guys enjoy it and feel free to ask questions. Before diving into the topic, I want to give a quick background on myself. Uh, I graduated from Uni with Liverpool in the UK and uh, SciArc, uh, majored uh, in architecture, and uh, then currently uh, I'm now a Master in Design Studies candidate at Harvard University, uh, focusing on the media and the technology. Um, so as you can see, the left side is a image of a 3D scanned version of myself. I call it a digital twin. Uh, since last year, I've been running a creative studio, Play.Work, um, which has the same website, Play.Work, with uh, another curator, Yuting, and uh, other freelancers remotely. Fortunately, I have collaborated with some of the top brands, such as Barry, 
Posa Cars, London Fashion Week, as well as some musicians such as Victor Ma, Ma Bo Qian, Chris Lee, Liu Yichun, to bring my design into their music videos. Uh, so today uh, I'm going to talk about uh, a few projects. I'll try to um, keep it as short as possible. I'll show more work and uh, talk less. Uh, I'll show some uh, personal and academic projects uh, which are quite research-based and a few commissioned projects uh, depend depending on the time. Uh, so I think the key points of my work can be described as uh, for every project, I create a customized tools and workflows for that project. And also, um, there are there there is a common thing in my different projects, which is uh, they all are rooted at the intersection of digital and physical. Uh, because I believe we live in an era of rapid technology change, and it's becoming easier for us to operate new technologies and tools. At the same time, our understanding of technology has become more and more superficial and fashionable. However, the emergence and the initial point of many technology are far more profound and humanistic. Understanding the tools and the techniques we use and respecting their logic and limitations uh, with humanities is the path I choose. So I believe designers of the past generation mainly use the ready-made tools, while future designers should invent their own methods and tools. Now let's move on to a few projects. Uh, the, the first one is called the Curiosity. This project asks, uh, this, this project uh, it's more about uh, creating a customized workflow coupling unrelated physical and digital techniques in order to create a new formal expressions. Uh, in this project, uh, we scan building facades with photogrammetry recomposed the structure samples in computer and 3D printed them and uh, spray painted by hand. So let's see the project. Uh, and the beginning in the beginning of the workflow, we uh, we scanned uh, uh, a lot of facades in downtown LA. Uh, these facades are like uh, our uh, assets, and then we composed uh, this kind of three uh, D facades into building blocks. Uh, as you can see in this digital model, uh, there are a lot of different uh, uh, facades coming from different buildings. Uh, this is a 3D rendering of that uh, digital model. Uh, as you can see, it retains a lot of details. And uh, we love the imperfection of such model. Then we 3D printed this model uh, like that, uh, block by block. Uh, in order to do the spray painting uh, to color it, first we printed uh, some samples in order to test uh, how different colors work with each other physically. So these are the uh, color palette samples made by spray painting uh, on these sample blocks. And then we spray painted uh, this single model unit with uh, masks. This, 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 this kind of masks are just uh, the tissue papers. Uh, and as you can see, there are uh, different uh, joint units with gradient colors. And uh, this is a final physical model after combining these blocks. Uh, in this project, we want to ask uh, uh, whether it is the deconstruction of the original building or the reapplication of new materials the building itself become more and more difficult to distinguish. So uh, what is new? What is old? Uh, is it a copying of the original building? Uh, what is the creation of uh, myself as a designer? So we think the, for this project, uh, the key point is to uh, sample real-world materials 
and then bring them into the digital world and then manipulate these models in digital world, then bring them back into the physical world to spray painting colors. Uh, during this process, information might be changed, um, but we also created uh, like another layer of originality on it. Uh, this image shows different angles of that building, uh, that physical model. As you can see, for example, this part comes from the Broad Museum in downtown Los Angeles. And you can also notice uh, different buildings in this one building block. Uh, let's move on to the next one. Uh, this, this project called the Painted Room. It's about uh, the renaissance of traditional analog painting in the post-digital age. Let me play the video first. Uh, in this project, uh, we uh, we explored the analog paint, uh, the process from analog painting to digital painting, and how it can change the reading and affect the design of spaces and objects. At first, we explored color combinations and stroke shapes with acrylic and other traditional paints, like this. We tested different color combinations and how they affect each other. And then we use a photo to sample the brush strokes. Uh, they, we, so far, uh, from now, we bring them to the digital world. And then in Cinema 4D and Redshift Renary, we uh, created this procedural shader, which can automatically generate 3D painting brush, uh, brushes from a single image, like this. These images are the working progress image. Uh, as you can see, uh, for that shader, uh, it automatically generates uh, uh, generate dust in concave areas and uh, scratches on uh, convex areas. And after that, we created a, a, a kit of assets with uh, furniture being painted digitally and then compose this interior room. In order to enhance the effect, we also added some single brush strokes like this. And here is actually a mirror. So this is an interior room of that painted room. We also have another video showing the room design. This is a, a infinite loop video showing the design of the interior uh, and uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an NFT. Uh, yeah. yeah, it's a digital art piece. As you can see, when we compose the 3D renderings and the 2D background, uh, 
they create a tension between the 3D and 2D because the background is always static and always facing to the camera, which is flat. So it creates an illusion that um, a, the, each frame might be a, 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 pay, a painting work. So during this process, the original information carried on the analog paint strokes has been shifted, challenging the traditional dualistic relationship between analog and digital. For this part, we combined the different render passes. We combined the different render passes, um, such as normal paths, bump normals, um, depths with the realistic rendering. So as you can see, even the render is photorealistic, but it's a digital render because they are supported by the information like this kind of gray and blue uh, informations. In terms of the design of this interior room, uh, it comes from a Baroque style uh, interior room. So it, uh, I mean, uh, we can select uh, any uh, original model and apply such effect. Uh, so next I'll be talking about the Fidgetal Supermarket Trilogy. It has three uh, short films. I'll try to be quick. Uh, and you can see uh, the title has a Fidgetal and a Supermarket. Fidgetal is a word uh, doesn't in uh, fidgetal is a word that doesn't exist in dictionary. It's a word composed by combining physical and digital. Uh, it doesn't have a defined meaning so far, so we can understand it from different perspectives in different projects. For the supermarket, uh, we choose this topic because we can uh, source a lot of different uh, stuff objects from daily life. Uh, supermarket contains a lot of objects that we generally ignored uh, in our daily life, and the supermarket uh, is all over the world. The first project is uh, three supermarkets. Uh, so Supermarkets is an infinite loop film with a shopping cart riding across multiple coexisting fictional supermarkets. It explores the hybrid compositing of the emerging physical and digital mediums and technologies. Let's watch the film first.
right. So uh, the production process of this, the design and the film used uh, industrial grade six axis robot arms and the shooting equipment, green screen shooting, volumetric video capture, photogrammetry, cinema 4D, redshift, 2D and 3D compositing, and other custom build techniques and workflows. Familiar but neglected objects such as apples and snack bags were scanned as either static model or animated model sequences from a physical world to the digital space. Uh, we have different types of assets. Uh, this slide shows uh, the mesh models downloaded from internet, and we changed the color so it uh, those. Uh, bottles are acting like acting as lights. This is a static photogram trade model of a snack bag. Uh, we have a version of original textures and a version of uh, we call it uh, archaeology texture. It's like the snack bag has been. Uh, it has uh, like a lot of years. Uh, this is the process how we scan it. Uh, we just took a lot of photos around the object. Uh, and then we also have the volumetric video. Uh, what is volumetric video? It's simply the animated uh, 3D scan. Uh, uh, this is a setup we uh, created with three um, cameras with depths. So those three cameras can not only uh, capture the color information, but also capture the depth information. Let me show you a quick example of what the volumetric video means. For example, this is rolling apple. The digital model simply looks like that. The digital model already contains the animation. And you can see the re resolution is super low. That's also what we want. Uh, and we also have the green screen shooting footages, uh, like the bags and the bottles. And this is a shooting setup. Uh, we can remotely control the light. Uh, for the compositing, we key out the background and uh, combine the color layer and the mask layer directly in Cinema 4D in the 3D world uh, to render that output. So finally, we create a three distinct world made of different uh, supermarket objects. As you can see, as the camera is always facing forward, uh, those bottles and uh, chip bags made from green screen shooting are look quite real. And this is another C. Uh, so move on to the second episode, Fidgeto Shopping Cart. This one is all about a miniature. I'll quickly um, show the video. Uh, basically, it's a, a miniature C in a shopping cart in a supermarket. Uh, from this image, you can see there are uh, like uh, sub seas in this sea. This apple part, which is a farm, and the left uh, snack bag, which is a cafe. Uh, let's watch the film directly.
uh, forgot to mention this project was made in collaboration with another curator, Yuting. Uh, so these are just still images of the different subsea. For example, this one is a farm, a cinema, uh, a playground, and a mini shopping car, a mini supermarket with disorder effector applied on, and a cafe made with Verona effector, combining different la different layers of render passes. Uh, this is a start of our process. We we first tested the, uh, we first try to create a shader in order to mimic the miniature effect, so it looks like a, a small stuff, and it can automatically generate the dust and the scratches. Uh, how we com how we did the layout of each single C and the draft model uh, lighting process. We use the warm and the blue light with a white model to do the lighting. And then the render and the compositing with the film effect. So these are the all the style frames. Uh, I'll quickly jump over this part which is more about how we organize the files. And fortunately, this one won the uh, Architectural 3D Awards last year. Uh, they sent us a very shiny trophy. Uh, let's move, move on to the last episode of the Fidgetal Tool Supermarket Trilogy. This one actually explores the uh, interactive architecture between objects and between characters in a fictional way. Uh, let's watch the film directly. Uh, this project uh, has a Chinese audio and a Chinese subtitle, but uh, I think uh, the, the voiceover is just about uh, what's happening in the sea. Uh, I believe our audiences can understand it. Probably we will publish another English version later. But so far, uh, we'll just play to the Chinese version. Uh, and uh, it's currently exhibiting in K11 in Shanghai. <laughs>
。您在超市里看到的一切都在这里集中整理、储存、转运。Uh, that's it, uh, and let's jump over. So as you can see, there are five different uh, supermarket worlds. Um, we also created the physical model of these worlds, and we believe that's uh, part of the digital, uh, part of the meaning of the digital. Uh, because the digital world and the physical models shares different resolutions. Okay. Okay. Uh, and finally, I'll quickly show a commercial project uh, I did before. So, uh, you'll see through these two projects, you'll see uh, how architecture students find opportunities out of the box. Uh, for this project, I want to see archi how architecture can be branding content. Uh, Burberry asked, asked us to uh, create a world and uh, put some virtual dancers uh based on the monogram pattern so we designed this summer pool set with the barbarous monogram pattern 
uh, from large scale, it looks like uh, the monogram, and uh, in the small scale, uh, the the surface also has such feature. And this, these are the behind the seas. Uh, so let me quickly play it. All right, so the last one, uh, this commissioned project uh, is a collaboration with Postal Cars and the Wallpaper Magazine. It's called Pure Feature. In this film, uh, I combined the robot arms and the 3D printing. Uh, so as you can see, this the, the exhibition uh, was 3D printed by the digital robot arms conceptually and I keep the, the support and the brims of the 3D printing like these edges. Uh, the process was like uh, by hacking the slicer software uh, like hacked, hacked the g-code file uh, so I can extract the uh, true 3D printing path from that file and generate such model. All right, let's play the video. So uh, in summary, I think uh, 
we are entering a metaverse fusing space, screen, sound, and uh, scent to create a bespoke perception experience. Uh, thank you. Uh, you can check my Instagram or website here. Uh, so we have next guest Yambo coming. Uh, stay tuned for very cool work. Hello, Yambo, are you here? Yes, uh, I can share my screen the moment uh, I should start. Yeah, of course. You can start whenever you finish. You are ready. Great. So just a minute. Now introduce. Oh, yeah. Okay, uh, can I introduce you at first a little bit? <laughs> yes, yes, of course, yeah. of course, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, Yambo is a, a re, uh, Yambo is a re-owned uh, multidisciplinary artist, the founder of creative director of Yambo Studio, and the co-founder of NFT and the digital uh, ecosystem, Disrupt. Thank you for the introduction. Um, did my video streaming well? Can you see my screen? Yeah, it looks perfect. Great, great. So first of all, uh, apologize for um, the, the video streaming. I have some problem with uh, my camera, so I, I'll just do it uh, through the uh, the screen sharing. Um, thanks a lot for having me. Um, all the talks so far was uh, really fascinating, um, especially the, the 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 last one from uh, Leo, which is uh in a very similar lines to what i would love to talk today which is about figital and the metaverse and uh and similar topics so i will jump directly into the presentation um so first of all the the talk today is pretty different from what i usually doing usually it's uh, about the studio work and and the content we produce and today i was thinking to structure it a little bit different uh, I will start with some uh, background introduction uh, about myself and about the studio. Um, so my name is Yam. Uh, my nickname is Yambo, which evolved to be the studio name uh, over the years. Um, on 2015, um, the studio started based on the idea of global collaboration. This was the main trigger to start um, uh, creating everything we're doing at the studio. I will just... Um, play some of the of the content we are producing um, while I, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit how it started. Um, so uh, there is only myself and Ronnie in Israel. Ronnie is dealing with the production side and I'm creative directing each project that we are doing and usually working on the 3D side as well. Um, and the, the vision was to come up with a studio that that is purely based on collaborating with great digital artists from across the globe and not having any uh, kind of like full-time employees here in Israel. Uh, we started small um, and over the years, I uh, think... Um, grew and 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 become bigger um I, I think that the moment things become really big for us was 2017 and 18 when we started to, to work with um actually mostly chinese technology companies such as xiaomi oppo vivo um we created a lot of uh, brand films and movies from them um so this was everything we've been dealing over the past six years uh, basically creating um, cgi content for uh, usually big brands um, and, and sometimes during the middle of last year, so approximately around October 2020, um, there was this vision to create uh, something new based on the same collaborative workflow. Um, and eventually it came up into a platform uh, that's supposed to serve artists and collectors to push the boundaries of uh, digital and digital art um, and, and this platform called Disrupt, and it's something I would like to start with um, and, and, and tell you a little bit um, how we started and what are the, the next steps that we are uh, planning over the next month and, uh, and mainly over next year. Um, so if I need to put it very shortly, 
Uh, Disrupt is uh, sort of a creative ecosystem um, combining digital and physical arts uh, with the whole idea and technology of uh, blockchain, NFTs, uh, collectibles. Uh, we, and the main, the main uh, vision is to merge realities in digital fashion and gaming. Uh, I strongly believe that um, as the time will pass, the metaverse will become uh, something very dominant in, in our lives. And we want to be those ones that will design and define uh, the rules and the, and the visual language of the metaverse. Um, so if I need to speak about the first steps, uh, along uh, February this year, I created the first NFT. Uh, it was a collaboration with a good friend and, and a very talented uh, designer called Somai San. Um, most of you probably know Somai. He's been doing some of the most amazing uh, phone commercials initially for Oppo and later on for many other brands. And uh, this was um, transhumanism exploration that he started and and I joined him to create this first NFT. Uh, we sold it online and it was like a, a, a great, nice first experience. Um, then later on, we started to mess with digital sneakers. Uh, I can go back to my live stream and show you just some of the 3D printing um, of this shoe. So basically this was printed um, in Germany uh, by a company called Zellefeld, and they are basically exploring um, the potential of uh, digital printing. Uh, so we designed a bunch of shoes and we're going to uh, offer them and sell them when this drop will go live. Um, then later on, we created this uh, digital NFT visualizer. Inside it contains an artwork from a Canadian artist called uh, Vinny Nasso. And the actual visualizer was built by a Swedish um, craftsmanship and designer called Love Hulten. And uh, we saw this as an NFT online and then eventually shipped the actual visualizer uh, to the collectors. The collectors was um, uh, a couple from Miami called Lot555. Um, they are two amazing uh, people that support the, the digital and physical art field um, and collected a bunch of the stuff that we did. Um, now I want to talk a bit about the platform and actually I would love to do, to do like a short live demo of uh, how it actually looks like and what are we trying to build and building and supposed to launch in the next month. Um, so I will jump um, into the test net of Disrupt. Um, this is the homepage and it's going to have a bunch of uh, articles that explain about the digital collectibles and what they are and about digital fashion. Uh, this is the first drop that's going to be in collaboration with uh, um, Zhu, which is a great Chinese artist that's dealing with digital fashion. Um, some of the collections in the galleries and I link to, directly to the gallery. Um, if I will jump right into my account, um, I will be able to show you some of the core functions of what we are trying to build. So uh, first and most of all, the platform is, is built on the Ethereum blockchain. Um, I can disconnect my wallet for a second uh, just to show you uh, very quickly how it's operate. So right now I will connect my wallet with the MetaMask extension, which is basically just uh, uh, a way to uh, hold cryptocurrency on the on, on the, the directly as a web extension and uh, currently the most common um, web wallet. Uh, and let's try to create an NFT together. Basically, we built our own smart contracts from scratch. Um, so we are not using any existing API, API, but just our own way to do things. And the reason we did it is because we want to be the first one that will offer uh, digital support, support for NFTs. So let's, for example, drag um, those shoes from UV um, and let's go into the minting process. Um, the image will upload um, to IPFS, which is a way uh, for decentralized hosting of content. And as you can see, most of the current marketplaces for NFTs are um, offering support for standard artworks, but we are developing the whole idea of minting digital collectible. So basically um, you can directly uh, put a description and title and, and define the quantity of the items, but at the same time, you can also uh, include 
um, additional images and content of the digital content. So for example, I can drag um, some of the digital items over here, um, add a bunch of details. And uh, basically if I'll click next, I'll be able to mint them on the blockchain. Um, in order to, to be efficient with the time, I won't do it. And I'll just jump into my account page and show you some of the functions like having assets that will be included um, side to the NFT, um, viewing it on Etherscan, um, just to see the actually proof of ownership of the blockchain, um, uh, list the asset for sale with fixed price, offer on an auction. And basically we're building our own way and our own ecosystem um, that should basically redefine the, the way uh, people um, collecting, trading, and and dealing with NFTs because I feel that the whole field of NFTs is is, is very unique, but it still didn't um, show its full potential because it's something very new. And this is what we're basically trying to do: trying to uh, to look at everything that done over the past year and build things from scratch uh, with a bit more um, thinking and logic about the all. Uh, my idea of the metaverse and about digital um, specifically. Um, so I, as I mentioned, um, the, the, the whole idea is, is that collectors could, could empower directly a global community of creators and artists. Um, over Yambo Studio, currently uh, we have a Slack channel with around 500 digital artists from across the globe uh, that, that evolved to be a, com a small community. Uh, it started by us finding a way to reach to talented people. And over time, it became a small uh, community of people that talk, share information, artwork, inspiration, and just uh, spend the, their uh, digital days together. Um, and, 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 and the thinking behind it was to take this community and elevate it into a, a next level of uh, consuming digital content. Um, so maybe just for a moment to talk about the, the goals of, of Figital. I think that by connecting digital and, and physical artists, um, we, can, we can merge those words um, and, and offer items for people that are not necessarily familiar with the digital world. Um, we can facilitate, facilitate cross-disciplinary collaboration, um, creating innovative artwork and product that blur the boundaries between the real world and the unreal world um, in order to build cultural value. Um, maybe I can talk a little bit next about the metaverse. This is an artwork by Paul Milinski that will come on this drop later on this year. Um, it's got a lovely concept and I don't want to reveal too much, so I just included a bunch of stills from the process. Um, as you can see, we are always dealing, just like in the studio, with photorealistic rendering um, and, and trying to bring the, uh, the quality that we have in the physical life of realistic uh, shading and lighting into, um, into the digital world, which is um, sometimes tricky to do and sometimes it's a, it's a big effort, but I believe it could really help bring more people into a world that uh, could feel sometimes very cold and... and, and and yeah, one of the, one of those things. So so about the metaverse, uh, what is the metaverse? Um, as, as I see it, is it's a global shared space which physical reality united with uh, persistent virtual space, um, made up of all existing digital platform brought together as one. So um, the metaverse is basically the future of digital and physical artwork and design. Uh, it will become the space in which we socialize create and live together. Um, and I think that it's in ideal form, the metaverse will be the arena in which post-internet cultural innovation thrives. Um, in other words, I think that uh, right now, the, the usage that we have for our digital product is very limited. Uh, and as the time passes, and more platform will allow us to um, use the, the things we own in the digital space uh, would really help change the, the whole uh, way the, the people currently consuming the digital content. Um, so just a bunch more examples about uh, some of the things we are uh, currently in the production. I'm not revealing again fully the, the full product because this is a part of the, the plan for 
uh, each of the drops under this wrap, but just to speak about them at least briefly. Um, so think about uh, a digital collectible, uh, a code that you can purchase, but it's not just a nice MP4 that you can uh, show on your digital frame or on your iPhone or computer, but you can actually use it. So just for a few examples of uh, different usages we are creating uh, for those collectibles. Um, so uh, you can load those into games that support uh, loading of uh, OBJ and, and open source 3D files. This is an example of the way we are implementing um, uh, some of the product from the first drop into Sansar, uh, which is a, a game. Um, this is uh, some of the uh, AR filters we are creating. Uh, so basically, the moment you purchase this mask, you already be able to uh, own it on the Disrupt platform. You can uh, download uh, assets, uh, low poly and high poly assets in order to load them into different kind of gaming. Um, and basically, we're trying to uh, provide also usability ourselves uh, in games like uh, Decentraland or, and basically trying to reach to all the innovators in the field of the metaverse and helping uh, connect those products so people could basically own them and also use them in, in gaming. And I think that all this uh, approach of approaching a digital fashion and digital design and trying to, uh, to think of the product themselves and not about the game uh, uh, so, so, so just to give a better example, if we're looking at, 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 at and exist on existing um, games like uh, Fortnite or um, World of Warcraft, the current way to to own um, skins for the gaming are from the the marketplaces uh, that are accessible directly from those games. And I think that the future is having a full decentralized way to own your assets and then just use them in every game you would like to, to, to use. So as I see it, as the time will pass, more platform will allow um, supporting uh, those type of assets and, and using them and allowing people through decentralization of uh, their assets and owning them um, but by themselves, but, but basically have the ability to use them in different um, uh, type of games and and. Uh, and AR solutions. There is also the whole idea of uh, AR dressing. Uh, there are companies like DressX, for example, which allow you to take a photo of yourself and then use um, um, the digital garment that you own on your physical photograph and just upload it to the social media. And this is also something we, we're going to allow uh, when we launch. So basically people that uh, collect and uh, own some of those assets will be able to um, use them in many different ways right away. Um, and digital fashion is just one of those examples. One other example is uh, those this sofa by uh, uh, by by uh, Paul Malinsky, which we are currently producing physically, um, real size scale, uh, but also digitally. Uh, so ideally, the people that will own it will be able to. Um, collect it and put put it on their uh, virtual home, and at the same time, uh, some of those collectors will have it on their or their, on their physical space. And I think this connection is really um, what I see the future and the things uh, the metaverse could evolve. Um, a bit about digital applications. So one of the first example um, is this visualizer I uh, shared with you earlier. Um, and, and, and the idea here is very, very simple. It's basically creating a physical device to show something that is, is, is authenticated on the blockchain. Um, and there are different ways to verify the authenticity of the asset from the device. Um, and this is something very powerful because the moment someone owns, owns something and he get the physical device um, to his door, um, he will be able to uh, verify that the asset is owned by him and then let the machine play if the asset is owned by him. And if not, the asset basically won't be able to play. And, and those type of things, I think, really could help, could help merge those wars. So this is one of the first things we did. Uh, moving forward, I just uh, talked about um, um, this digital armchair, uh, which will be revealed fully uh, later this year. 
um, and and there are a lot more more possible interesting possibilities in this in this whole idea of creating um, objects that are existing in real life, but basically designed and born in the digital um, in the digital field. And and I think one more interesting topic is this intersection. It's not necessarily have to design digitally and then manufacture physically. I think there is an intersection on the way those things created. Sometimes there could be some simulation in, in, the, in the 3D world that could cause a certain thing to be born and then it could be pre 3D printed or just manufactured physically in order to, to bridge the gap between uh, those uh, worlds better. If I need to think about the future and where we are standing in, at this point in, in time, um, I would say that right now we can see adoption of NFTs. Um, at least for the beginning of the year, we saw a lot of uh, more and more people starting to adopt NFTs. Um, global digital community starting to form. Communities such as uh, Super Rare or Nifty Gateway or Foundation. Uh, basically allowing the interaction between the collectors and the creators uh, and, and basically allowing digital collectibles to grow. Um, and, and, and ideally, NFTs will enable creators to generate wealth and build communities around them. The next step, as I see it, is basically uh, the growth of usability. So games and social platforms will continue to join the metaverse and allow assets to be loaded easily, easily sorry, to, to their platforms uh, and allowing us to offer uh, assets for the people in an easier way. Uh, the space in which NFTs can be utilized uh, will continue to increase basically. Uh, thinking on the next step, I think that the immersive digital experiences uh, would be the main reason for people to starting to really adopt um, NFTs in general and, and digital collectibles and more specifically. Uh, so increasingly powerful solutions uh, emerge to present digital collectibles through immersive experiences. Uh, I think that photorealistic digital galleries uh, will will help experience think, things in the digital world in a, in a much more immersive way. We already can see all the effort that uh, big corporations, such as Facebook, for example, putting into those immersive experiences. Um, and I truly believe that uh, the future is within through decentralizations and allowing people to um, use what they already own. And I think the, the, the final step would be the physical and digital union, basically mass adoptions of collectibles. Uh, as the digital community grow, collectibles will become a part of the mainstream culture. Uh, users will build and enhance their digital identities and personal spaces within the new grounds of the metaverse, blurring the boundaries between physical and digital eventually. Um, so yeah, as, as I said, I, I, I didn't show too much today about the studio work, uh, which you can obviously go to the website and see some of the stuff that we're doing in the studio. But what excites me most, and I, it's actually the, the topic of this whole um, conference and, uh, and, 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 and day of amazing talks is, is about digital and its potential. And, and basically, I would love you guys to go to disrupt.com and sign up to the, um, to the inner circle. Uh, there is a, a small uh, field to just put your email um, and, and you can just get an email from us when, you, when we will go, li go live. Um, and there is also a light paper which explain everything I, um, I talked in this uh, uh, short call more in depth. Um, and would love to, to, to see you then and try to be an uh, innovator in, in this field. Um, so yeah, that's it. Thank you very much for, uh, for having me again and for uh, listening to this call. Uh, Thank you, Yambo. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, uh, actually, we have two guests, Coyola and Luis, who cannot join us today because of personal matters, but they have already recorded videos to present. Uh, it will be like totally about 20 minutes. 
um, and we will enter the free discussion after their presentation. Um, to, today we are running a little bit late, but I believe the free discussion will be super cool. So uh, we'll come back when you have a little little break. Yeah, let's play the videos of uh, Coyola at first. Okay. This is Coyola, an Italian media artist based between London and Rome. Technology is a sort of primary focus of my work. Uh, I use technology not so much as a tool, but rather more as a collaborator. I'm interested in engaging with technology to discover things that are perhaps beyond the human senses. I'm interested in how technology is providing us new ways, new perspective on how to, to perceive reality. Machines don't quite care how beautiful a landscape is. They have a very different understanding of how they're trying to uh, see. So this uh, essentially is one of my main topics. It's how do machines see the world and what are the differences between how we see and how machines see and perhaps what could arise between these kind of interactions between mixing the ways we see and the way machines see uh, and taking this almost as an opportunity to discover new things. Sometimes I'm very intrigued by the impossibility of machines to see as well as us and sometimes I'm intrigued in the possibilities that machines have that are far beyond what our human capabilities are. So I really like to play on this kind of uh, interaction between the impossibility of the machine to see perfectly but at the same time the features that this machine can bring uh, to us in how they see, which is very, very different from uh, what we do. I'm very interested not so much in looking at new things, but actually looking at our past with these new methodologies, with these new apparatuses. Uh, so there's many different sort of historical topics from, say, the tradition of landscape painting and the sort of pictorial representation uh, to the idea of classical sculptures and somehow articulating uh, matter uh, to looking at classic iconographies and sort of more uh, historical topics like that. So there's a variety of uh, lines of inquiry that I bring forward from several years looking at these um, historical topics with very different technological apparatuses. So an important topic that I've been exploring extensively over the last few years is the tradition of landscape painting. And more specifically, the sort of modern tradition of landscape painting, sort of end of 19th century, uh, where there's a, a series of experimentation with the idea of representation, what it means to represent something. And this sort of quest to represent nature as a vehicle to discover something else. And this is the time when really new techniques, new ways of seeing, new ways of painting are really developed. And it is through this process that ultimately total abstraction is reached. So for me, it's a very kind of interesting period because in a way it really talks about the way we see, the way we perceive the world and perhaps uh, force us to engage in very different ways of seeing, kind of questions the way we've been looking at things before. In a similar fashion, I guess I put myself in the sort of shoes of the uh, modern landscape painter. Uh, I like to go out, confront myself with nature in a similar way that they were doing, but at the same time with a very different technological apparatus. Sometimes I go back to some of these historic locations, for example, I spend time where uh, Van Gogh spent the last years of his life or in France looking at several gardens that have been painted through the years from the Impressionists. So I go back on these very same locations, but again, bringing with me different uh, bits of technology to capture data, to capture these landscapes uh, in a way that our eyes really can see, capture some kind of information that are beyond our human comprehension, and then gather all this data and develop some systems, some custom software to analyze this data and ultimately create new representations of these landscapes. So in one way these uh, new landscapes that I produce refer in a way or another to these original techniques. Sometimes they can look almost painterly, however they're 
completely computer generated and completely created using uh, custom software. Uh, developing my own algorithms is really part of, uh, of what I do. Mostly what I do is develop systems and I see these systems almost as musical instruments. I like to develop these instruments and then spend months playing these instruments to really create the new works. So there is a very interesting interaction for me between, again, man and machine, in this case, myself and the tools that I, that I engage with. It's not so much about developing a tool that automatically looks at something and brings me back an image, but rather develop a tool that then I'm able to interact with. And I think it's this interaction that makes it uh, hybrid somehow, makes it in this kind of uh, space between, again, human and machine. It's not so much one or the other, it's a kind of combination of these two minds, of these two kind of skill sets, of these two kind of visions. So as part of this, uh, let's say, pictorial research and uh, research on the idea of representation, there's been several works, several uh, series. Um, one of these is called Jardin de Thé, which again uses a, a custom software to analyze uh, some ultra high resolution video uh, footage. The video footage was shot during the night in the gardens of this castle in France and then uh, analyzed through again this special software and a series of computer simulations generate almost impressionist like uh, moving images that really remind you of a painting, somehow really remind you of the sort of impressionist kind of pictorial uh, materiality, but at the same time they are completely computer generated and you can really see behind that that there is a logic that is not human, it's not a brush stroke, it's not the hand painting this, there is something else. So on one side they are confronted with something that is very familiar, on the other side something that is very unfamiliar and it's I think the tension between these two elements that it's um, crucial to this project. I think more widely it is crucial to all of my work. All of my works are really uh, about the tensions and equilibriums between very different elements, somehow opposing forces that interact and meet in a very specific place. Hello everybody, thank you so much for inviting me. It's really great to be here, or rather to be here through video. It's a shame that I cannot be with you today, but um, hopefully we will be able to strike a conversation to have a bit of a dialogue somehow um, through email and so on. Um, so I thought I would present a little bit of what I do and the sort of work that I do. I, I thought about how I would name this, this talk and I thought about the idea of materiality and situated technologies. Um, so I haven't introduced myself. My name is Luis Hernan. I work at the Sheffield School of Architecture and part of my work has to do with digital technologies, with in general architecture and, and digital cultures. Um, I'm going to be presenting a bit of my work and, and trying to create a narrative of what is it that I, that I do in general. Um, one thing I should say, when I say work, when I present the sort of things that I do, it's actually very buried in the sense that um, sometimes some of the work that I'm going to be presenting um, it's creative practice. Part of my work has to do with creative practice. So I do a lot of photography. I also do quite a bit of electronics. I also do um, installations, performance. Um, but I also sort of think of myself as an academic and as a writer. So a bit of what you're going to be seeing is um, things, is narratives, is, is dialogue that I've been developing in different pieces, normally in journal articles, in conference papers and so on. So um, I will basically just be talking about this as work, as my work, but um, it will come from different sources. It will come from different formats, shall we say. Um, so let's get started. And as I was saying, my work has to do with technology. My work has to do with um, the power of technologies and more t more than anything with corporations and the power that corporations have in order to define the sort of things that we that we do in design, the sort of things that 
uh, we as designers, as artists, are concerned with, especially with things like the everyday, everyday life with domesticity. Um, and my sort of journey started with this idea of wireless as material. And this work had a lot to do with interaction design. And that at that point, I was coming from to this area from that perspective, from the perspective of interaction design, trying to understand the sort of spaces, the sort of uh, different ways that a technology like wireless, um, and by wireless I mean any form of, of um, information protocol that uses electromagnetic fields as a way of transmitting information. Um, of course, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, but also cellular networks, GPS, all these different array of technologies, I sort of class them as wireless. And I was interested in thinking about this, um, not only as a technology, but also as a material. And of course, um, when I talk about material here, I come from this sort of design art sort of perspective that we create spaces, we create experiences by manipulating materials. And part of what I wanted to suggest is that we could design by manipulating these technologies, not only by installing these technologies in our buildings, for instance, in our cities, but that we could, in effect, design the way that they behaved. And by doing that, that we could change the way that people use these technologies in urban spaces, in private spaces, and we could be creating something completely new to the sort of things that we are used to. And the beginning of that was in this sort of thing. So I started working with electronics and doing my prototypes and doing my instruments in order to make these um, technologies visible. I sort of had this idea that in order for you to start working or to start understanding these technologies as um, material, just you needed to start by making them visible, by making sure that people would be able to see them, would be able to understand them. And of course, that is true of any technology, but it's especially true of wireless technology because you have this component, this huge component of electromagnetic fields that you cannot really see through the naked eye. So it's very difficult to try and understand the way that people imagine these technologies because we simply don't have any way of, of understanding them that easily. We don't have an image, a mental image of them. So I started doing this and I started sort of creating these instruments that would allow me to make this visible. And of course, I started creating these, these sort of um, visualizations. Sorry, I started creating these visualizations which effectively tried and, and sort of make visible that um, electromagnetic field to make visible the way that signals behave in space. Um, one of the things I wanted to do in these photographs was basically um, communicate the way that these um, signals fluctuated, were very uh, changing in different spaces. And the idea was to try and do that by connecting the level of these signals, this sort of signal strength to color, to a different color that would enable people to understand how they were behaving in, in, in um, interior spaces or in any space. And from that to sort of derive different sort of applications or different possibilities. And of course, I will keep, I, I, I will talk about this later, but you will see that I keep going back and making um, these references to things that have to do with solving things or with um, quite instrumental ways of understanding this technology. And of course, this was some of the sort of early work that, that was part of the process that I, that I did in order to create these, um, these photographs. I was basically creating almost like a performance that would enable me to, again, visualize this, this signal, this technology in space. And I started creating these sort of photographs of effectively the space around my body. And, but at that time, it was sort of in between those two, in between that, that drive to make these um, technologies visible, but also to try and understand that the way that I was doing that, the sort of performance, the sort of uh, process in which I was making these technologies visible were also having an effect on the way that I 
um, was thinking of them and of course of the way that I could communicate their materiality to, um, to all the people through these photographs. And one of the things that I realized and one of the, these photographs that you're seeing here is um, some of the early work that I started doing in um, interior spaces and of course wireless has a really 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 uh, wide range of applications it can be thought of at this at the level of a city at the scale of a city but it can also be thought of in at the scale of a home in the sense that we use different technologies in these different uh, environments in order to create in order to produce different applications or in order to use technology in different ways and part of what I wanted to do was to to sort of influence into try to understand that and of course what I realized and you will have noticed that I started using this term of materiality and of course I come from this tradition of architecture in which um, you are encouraged to use the idea of materiality and if any of you had studied architecture or have ever been invited to a school of architecture chances are that you have heard this this word this concept more than once and it's used quite a lot for instance when we are in reviews when we are um, discussing a building and the sort of thing that you also see or hear asked is yes but what, what about the materiality so yeah this this facade is all very well and good this render is all very well and good but what about the materiality of your building and of course in architecture the idea of materiality it's really one of those concepts that we use quite a lot to the point that it's lost all meaning and it's really used to define quite a wide range of things including tectonics including just really the materials that you're using in a in a building and the way that those materials having, are having an effect on the way that people understand that building, on this sort of atmosphere, on the sort of um, feeling that they have when they inhabit that, that building. And of course, for me, that notion also came through the idea of working with materials in a workshop. Of If we think, for instance, of working with wood, with timber, you would imagine um, that idea that as an artisan, as a, as a carpenter, you have this sort of notion, this relationship to the material in which you generate this sort of intuitiveness about what the material can do or the ways that you can change the material. So I was thinking of this in terms of these. I was thinking in terms of my own relationship to this technology, the relationship that all the designers could develop with this technology in order to create, in order to manipulate it. But one thing that I started noticing very quickly is that, of course, materiality is a really complex term. And when you go out of the confines of architectural theory, of design theory, you start realizing that materiality has many different meanings and it has different meanings, for instance, in sociology, in anthropology, but it also has a different meaning in philosophy. And one of the things that sort of influenced my work quite a lot is the idea of uh, feminist philosophy. And one of the philosophers that influenced me quite a lot in this, in this process, especially in this work, was Karen Barad and the idea of uh, materiality as something that is assembled. Um, and the idea is that you cannot really think about materiality as being something that is inherent in any material, in anything. It's something that is constructed. And when you think about these materials, these uh, sort of photographs, the way that I was presenting these, the way that I was able to visualize them, really depended quite a lot on a number of factors, but most importantly, it depended on the instruments I was, I was creating, it depended on the, um, on the performance that I was creating as well, this choreography, this dance that I was creating, in order to make this visible. And one of the things I realized is that when I finished these, these photographs, I started promoting and they were um, sort of taken up by different different outlets and, and, and different media. And I started having people write to me to talk about the sort of things that these photographs sort of made them think about. And what I realized is that it, the, the sort of responses were really, um, some of them were really strange, but also 
they sort of talk to different ways that the technology was understood or to different materialities or to different ways in which it um, sort of interface in which it had a relationship with the material realm in the sense that some people, for instance, as you can see in these in these um, cards that I'm showing in the screen, these are basically the um, emails that I received from different people, a selection of them. And the sort of overall theme of these uh, of these emails and some of them talk about electromagnetic danger, of course, making um, making connections with um, electromagnetic hypersensitivity. Some of the some of some of these emails talk about the aura, talk about spirit spirituality, uh, persons energy field. Um, some of them talk about this idea of Wi-Fi, of these signals being almost like a colonizing force, Wi-Fi coming through a wall. And they have you have this sort of range of ideas, this range of materialities and. This was really the beginning of uh, a process in which I realized that in order to make these technologies visible, it wasn't enough just to just work with my electronics in my in my electronics bench and to be working on that and just eventually coming up with an instrument that I could use and then photograph and then continue doing that as if I were basically doing a scientific experiment. The way that these technologies acquired a materiality, they became material, they became important, they have a sort of presence in the material world, really dependent on a number of things, and a lot of them dependent on de dependent on different different um, metaphors, on different analogies that people use in order to understand these technologies. And my sort of work from there started to branch out into understanding all these different forms of materiality, all these different ways in which the technology was um, sort of placed or deployed to use to use a term that use, is used quite a lot in technology, um, the way that these technologies were deployed in different contexts and the way that different communities, different people sort of connect and understand those technologies. What I've realized in my work is that when you look at materiality, when you look at the materiality of different different technologies, it's not enough to make these technologies visible. It's not enough to make these technologies more uh, easy to understand to this to designers, to artists. What you really need to do is to create also the tools to explore all the different forms of materiality, the way that these technologies find a place in everyday life, find a place in our homes, in our cities but also the way that corporations sort of work with them, the way that corporations use different ideas, different metaphors. So it's really looking at this whole range of materiality. And of course, in, in the case of wireless, it's about looking at the way that these technologies are made visible and invisible, not only in actual terms of creating um, parts of the electromagnetic spectrum that are invisible to the naked eye, but also the fact of how they make visible certain parts of the technology and they hide other parts of the technology and what are the consequences of that? What are the consequences in terms of the power that they have in order to define our everyday life, in order to define our behavior? Um, so that's it for me. Hopefully that I didn't go over time for too long. Um, it would be great to be with you and to be able to have a conversation and to hear your thoughts. Um, we won't be able to do that, but if you have questions, if you have comments, if you want to start a conversation with me, here are my details. Um, please send me, send me, send me an email. It would be great to to hear from you. Uh, thank you, and thank you, thank you so much. Hello, everybody. We come back. Um, thank you, everyone, for long wait. Um, then we will go into our free uh, discussion session, 
And right now, our, our audience can unmute by yourself and ask any question you want to ask our guests. And our guests can talk with each other freely. Anybody have questions or our guests want to talk a little bit with each other? Okay, so uh, I, I have some thoughts with the uh, CTK's work with, with Mike. Uh, actually, uh, I, yeah, Mike, are you there? Sure. Yeah. But I, but I missed uh, the question. What's, what, what, what's that question? Uh, actually, I, I don't have questions, but I have some thoughts okay. on your work. Um, I think, uh, so first, uh, I, I really like the, I like your work. I, I think they really inspired me, uh, especially the uh, materialities. Uh, I feel, for example, in the project the Shroom and the uh, Heat and uh, the, the TV2 Ident, also the uh, uh, Bobo Isumiyaki, commercial, uh, the materials looks very realistic, but this kind of material cannot exist in the physical world. So it's like you created a, a digital um, animated materials uh, in the in, in virtual world. For example, in the shroom, these objects looks quite like a real organism underwater. Uh, and uh, the color combination and the materiality of the rendering makes object look like uh, uh, some artificial but also natural stuff yeah so it's, it's yeah i think that's kind of uh, like what inspired me most uh so yeah, because uh, i think like it's it's, uh, it's the nature is the most most inspiring place to to look for this kind of stuff you know and then mixing it up with the imagination that you have yeah we we agree we, we've got some questions from audiences uh a person asked uh, could you explain the name of the company colors and the kids uh how did you come up with this name uh how to understand the word color in the name is it just for playful um it's we were looking for something with with colors and then um elizabeth found that song by uh cat power which is called colors and the kids and we thought that's quite nice and so we love colors and we love kids and we like how kids see the world you know without prejudice so that's why we saw like it's a it's a great name for a company, mm -hmm. especially to have this playful attitude towards uh, work and to find something new. Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, anybody want to talk with Yambo or with our other guests? Oh, sorry, talk with Mike. <laughs> um. Please. Um. Actually, hi, I'm Eva. Um, actually, I have a hi. question for all of our guests. Um, like I've noticed, uh, thank you for uh, all of your amazing presentations. I really enjoy uh, watching them. And um, I have a particular question. Uh, I remember when Yang was doing his presentation, he was mentioning, he was kind of paraphrasing his work with uh, techno music. And uh, I've noticed that in many of your works, you had a lot of a, a lot to do with musics and rhythms, and uh, especially, I mean, in this audiovisual era, how do you actually deal with the sound, and what is the relations you had to do, like with the uh, like your visual with the musics, and uh, and I would. Yeah, I, I'm really interested in how these kind of inspired your work and uh, how, yeah. yeah, Eva, could you uh like speak your question again in Chinese to Yang? Uh Yang just was I just ni you go some liman ni ti dala ni the nigga so techno music. 
对于你的视觉表达有没有任何影响？然后你会怎么就是去结合这个音乐和视觉语言？嗯，音乐音乐和就是音乐的话，其实，嗯，我在去做的就是在创作过程中，它会是，嗯，因为其实我在听音乐的话，它也是有很多随机性的，不会是把，嗯，所有的音乐像排歌单一样去就是展，就是去一一个一个一个的去听，我可能是也是按照一些这种随机性的一个歌单来去排，所以说我在做一些就是。创作的过程中，其实也是一个，嗯，就是蛮随机的一个过程，就包括它其实跟音乐一样，就它会有根据一些某种音乐的一些就是不同的感觉和律动，可能在我创作的过程中也会有一些变化。呃、uh, ，so I'll I'll do the translation again. So, uh, so the music I li、uh, he listen is is kind of random and, uh, um, his playlist he don't he don't categorize or sorting, um, his playlist. Because、uh, there's a randomness.、Um, uh, it's also like his work.、Um, uh, so he thinks、uh, the relationship is also、um, like. 就是就随机的音乐激发出，其实这个东西随机的是。哦 ，so so the relation is like a um is pretty random. The the random music kind of inspire his. Uh, his his work there's it's also has lots of random elements, so uh so he thinks it's a relationship between them. Um, thank you. Uh, what about you, Mac? Do you improvise in your sound, like as your visuals, or? Yeah, I th I think it it influences the. The visuals, you know, because、um, and sometimes we try to create visuals as fast as sound, but that's that's the main main difference between sound and、uh, the visual. That sound is way, way, way more real time compared to、um, to visual. I mean, you can work with something like Touch Designer, but、um, it's it's not it's not the same with a proper、uh, render engine, you know. Even though it's real time now, but you still have to wait, and it still has to transfer, and there are latencies and stuff like this, and、um, the ergonomics of、uh, translating your movement into the the machine is, is still it's kind of like it's still maybe the mouse or a tablet or something like this, and、uh, that is、um, it feels it feels kind of like very very still very stone age like the. The mechanics of how to operate、um, a system. So compared to music, when you play an instrument, you can use your hands, and、uh, even if it's an electronic music instrument, like the functions are mapped out to something, and it feels way, way, way immediate. I would say. Yeah, exactly.、Um, thank you for answering. And particular, I will also like to raise this question to Wang Jing because. I believe in her theater pieces. He,、uh, she has a lot to do with music and visual things, and especially when、uh, I'm really impressed in her work when she was overlapping the projection on the、uh, experimental stage. So I'm wondering how does she?、Uh, are you there, Jean? Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, I'm wondering how do you kind of. Uh, see these、uh, all kinds of different kind of media overlapping on each other, musics,、um, uh, projections, and、uh, experimental stage, etc. How do you deal with、uh, these overlapping media? Hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Your question. Um. I think、uh, as a theater practitioner, um. All the technology and、uh, it's like the media, or it's like the material, and it's like the tools we should mix together. But for me, the very important thing is the human, because we live in the digital age. But、uh, I also have some critical thinking.、Um, what the human we should be in this digital age? Um, so I think、uh, when I use the new media in the theater creativity, I see I still really focus about human. It's not just about visual, 
um, because I think the arts. I think uh, yeah, any anybody has a different uh, definition for arts. Uh, that's really okay, really fine. But for me, I really, really focus about the human, and uh, focus about the human living the contemporary life. So when I use the new media, I also think about uh, uh, what the human should. Be and what relationship, what a story I really want to share with audience. This is my key point. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Totally. I think uh, the kind of relation and feedback you got from the stage is not only from the visual, uh, like visual part you're perceiving, mm -hmm. but also from. Uh, the audio, the sound, how do you immerse yourself in it and the body and the movement. And those are like really kind of centered to the audience and the human. So Yeah, I really, I really like your question because, uh, um, for example, we study the theater. Theater is, uh, we still create some of the ancient Greek uh, script because this is maybe 3,000 years ago. But why we still present this story? But the key point is human. Because I think uh, we still can use a new media to present ancient Greek uh, script, but this is just a media. But what's the key point for us? This is my key question for my ask myself, and also my key question for my critical thinking. Thank you. Um, I love love your um, reply. Thanks. Thank you. I have some thoughts with uh, Yambo. Uh, because I think uh, yes. what we are doing shares a lot of the same stuff, especially uh, we are creating both physical and digital objects. Uh, I think what you are doing, the disrupt with uh, the disrupt, uh, which is very promising, uh, because uh, the technology development, technology development of AR and uh, mixed reality uh, will be quite ubiquitous in the coming years. Uh, so far, uh, we might live in a world that the physical and the digital are separated. Uh, but in the future, probably just in two, two, two or three years, uh, we will be living in a ubiquitous mixed reality world where the digital assets, digital objects will have the same real value as the uh, physical world stuff. At that time, for example, we might have uh, you know, our room uh, decorated by the digital objects, and then we can buy those digital objects. These digital objects has its own value in the economic system. Uh, yeah, that that's like my 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 thoughts on what you are doing. Uh, um, yes, I I feel that we do got a lot of uh, um, very similarities between the the things that we are doing, and I can't agree more about um, all the stuff you mentioned about and about the future of uh, digital and digital collectibles. Um, Maybe you know. Uh, I think a web. The, all the idea of of Web three is basically an, an interesting topic that uh, describes this whole scenario. Um, web three basically describes the next major iteration of the same web that we use today. Um, I think that Web three will allow for the full integration of cutting at edge technology, uh, NFTs, digital collectibles, cryptocurrencies and pretty much virtual reality into our everyday life. Um, uh, Web3 is the evolution of the internet that we need in order to get closer to the, to reclaim ownership of our data and get closer to them, what we call the metaverse. Um, uh, ideally with Web3, we'll have open source, decentralized and permissionless web experience where we can all contribute, communicate and interact without the problem those days. And the pro problem is the mediation by a third party. Um, and the moment that we'll have this ability to own our asset, um, I think it means greater freedom, less monopoly over our virtual assets and space, 
uh, by large tech um, corporations. And I, I think that the, the moment that more technologies will allow this ownership of those assets and basically what we are trying to build, um, it will definitely help accelerating this whole change. Right. Uh, I think from my point of view, uh, if the render looks photorealistic, it, it's like a physical stuff. Even it's so far only exists in the digital world. Uh, so uh, we noticed that you treat collaboration as an important part of your work, especially for creating NFTs. Uh, do you think uh, creativity and inspiration is a personal matter or uh, what's a key point of such kind of collaboration between Yambo and other freelancing artists. Uh, for example, the 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 one you collaborated saw me soon. Uh, we we know each other uh, in person in Shanghai, uh, and uh, another one, uh, Uv Zhu, who is doing the digital fashion. Uh, so we are just uh, quite curious about uh, how uh, this collaboration process is going, uh, and what's yeah. a key point of such collaborating in terms of creating NFTs. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for your question. Um, I think collaboration is essential to the development and innovation in any field, actually. Uh, and we firmly believe that collaboration leads to stronger and, and more interesting work um, in general. Uh, I think that instead of viewing collaboration as antagonistic to the individual creative process, it's the best to view it as opportunity to bring together point of views and elements of multiple people and ideas. Uh, that being said, you can still align your own vision with that of other artists. Um, I, I think the key to successful collaboration is to communicate frequently uh, and leave artists the room to create their own in their own terms. For example, the collaboration with UV uh, was with absolutely cr full creator freedom for him. And actually, I think the difference between Yambo Studio to Disrupt is that yeah, the studio serve clients. And when you're serving clients, you need to follow certain rules and certain briefs. And the whole idea with this whole new initiative is to have full freedom for the artists to create whatever they, they like, because I think this is the whole idea of art and digital art. Um, I think that you also be surprised if how I, often I... perspective... Yeah, please. May I ask, may I ask a question? How, how, how do you deal with the environmental impact of NFTs? So um, what's, yeah, what's, what's, the, what's, what's your take on this? You know, because the, the world is burning the, up and uh, I saw you're running on Ethereum and Ethereum is so inefficient a, in terms of energy consumption. That's a great question. Uh, thank you, Mike. Um, so first of all, um, we're running using ERC 1155 uh, compared to all the marketplaces which are running um, ERC 721, which is very technical, but shortly speaking, uh, it means that um, the environmental impact could be between 90 to 100 percent to 90, 99 percent less depends on how many assets you mint. For example, um, minting thousand assets could be on a single transaction on, on the Ethereum main network um, compared to working with ERC721, um, which is basically meaning that you need to make every transaction for every asset you you um, yeah. uh, you minting. So this is like like the one of the things that we can do at, at this point in time. But the, the, my main assumption and and what uh, basically should really change the way uh, Ethereum impact the globe is basically the the move, moving to Ethereum 2.0, uh, and basically it should be done by early 2020. Um, too, based on uh, Vitalik Buterin's uh, latest uh, conversation. And uh, basically, it means that there are going to be a few major changes, um, among them sharding. Um, and, and basically, sharding means, without going too technical, uh, that is instead of every participant in the network need to verify every transaction, um, only a, por a portion of the people needed to verify uh, a portion of the transactions 
Um, I might put it a little bit wrong, but uh, it means that uh, the gas fees and, and the impact uh, will be drastically low. Um, and, and there are a lot of um, other things with the 2.0 that should really um, not affect the globe as we heard about NFTs lately. I, I, I honestly did so much investigation on, on this topic and I feel that the hype around this topic is much larger uh, than it actually changing. I mean, if you look at, 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 at proof of work versus proof of stake, which is the main uh, change with 2.0, um, uh, basically, this whole concept is what making the, the the effect on the globe. I don't want to go with my answer too long, but just shortly speaking about this this uh, point. So proof of work means that in order to prove the identity of every participant in the network, uh, you basically need to prove uh, that you um, verifying the transaction by solving uh, complex uh, cryptocurrency uh, complex sorry. Um, uh, um, crypto um, mathematical riddles um, and by making your machine work every time you basically just like rendering uh, impact the, the globe by consuming power but by with proof of stake which should be done by early 2022 um, in order to verify your identity you only need to stake your money in a, in a pooling stake um, which basically mean that you no longer need to make your computer run 24 seven in order to confirm transactions. Again, I'm, I'm going too deeply into it, but basically I really, a true believer in, in what the Ethereum developers are doing and the, the fact, the way it's going to evolve uh, very soon. And, and this is basically um, how I think this, this whole field will evolve and basically impact the world less and less as the time will pass and as we move into proof of stake and sharding and all of those um, developments in the field of uh, crypt crypto and NFTs. Thank you. Um, yeah, so um, maybe just to finish my answer about about the, the, the whole collaboration question, um, I think that um, I started to say that the key for successful collaboration is to communicate frequently and leave the, the room for the artist to create on their own terms. Um, and, and most of the time, I think that things are do work in that way. Um, I think it's about working. Um, I, I, I mean, there is also obviously the, the, the whole level of personal communications and the way people are communicating. And obviously sometimes it's harder, but I feel that the moment you have a good communication and a shared artistic vision with the artist, uh, just by having the same digital space of working together, sometimes the result could be really great. And this is basically what we iterate in, and doing over the past few years with the studio and what I'm basically trying to do right now with this tribe on a different level. Yeah, thank you, Yambo. Thank you so much. Actually, uh, I have a like general question to ask uh, our guests uh, and to any guests. Um, I'm really curious that um, are you? Uh, what's your major in school? Are you uh, like you, you? Did you learn design like in in the school? And how do you begin to do uh, the like the uh, these design things? And uh, I see that a lot of works that you did uh, have collaboration with business, with marketing, and how these collaborations start. Um, for example, here in the studio, everybody has a different background. Yes. So somebody studied music, somebody else studied art, I studied uh, media art and then design. So it's kind of like it's a mixed pool, you know. And since we founded the studio with a couple of people, it's it's already coming from uh, different backgrounds. And um, I think I completely agree with, with Jambo there. It's like collaboration is always the, it's such a great tool to come to, to different results. Then, I mean, it's, it's great to work on your own because then you can and I need this too, but um, for for working with other people, it's it's most of the times very rewarding because you have that different point of view always with you. 
Yeah, I agree. Uh, I think that's where the creativity emerges uh, at the intersection of different uh, display, displays, different majors. Yeah. Yeah, because um, most of our our audience today are like architecture students, and some of them are really like confused with their future actually, and they are very interested in this in your work, like this amazing like amazing things can catch people's eyes. So they are wondering uh, whether or not this is a good chance to like try something different, like what you did. Not only focuses on architecture. Can you give some advice about this career? Yeah, it's a general question for uh, all guests. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. Oh. Hey, Yao. Oh, and yeah, yeah, yeah. So how, 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 how did you start a collaboration with fashion with fashion brands, oh, uh, brands and magazines. Uh, so what was your major uh, back to college? Uh, yeah, so I was a professor professor. 可能会去，因为因为比较比较对这就是嗯，fashion一些行业去比较感兴趣的，可能是嗯，就是一些朋友的契机来去跟他们一起合作的。对，其实对于我之前的一些嗯学术背景来说的话，其实没有说太大的关
sometimes I, I just think about do we need like a specific actor sort of character in the yeah, drama? So I know I know there are some like limitation of the equipment we have to wear. I said she was VR, but so I don't know, maybe if you have ever seen all these kind of possibility of bringing some actors or or non-human actor into the VR drama because you know in the digital world we don't need a specific human to play some action in the drama, but maybe just like what the real scenes were, like some of the like the the uh, strawberry can dance in front of you sort of things. I think this kind of moment can bring a lot of like possibility into the VR drama. I don't know yeah. if think about that. I can get okay. your message. I think yeah. maybe you you talk about the because some the VR um production, for example, VR, VR, or uh, VR um, uh, commercial pieces, and they just performed by the virtual person. I think mm -hmm. this is really really okay and really fine. But uh, what's the key mm -hmm. message? And uh, mm -hmm. I think uh, um, the the key message is really important. Whatever you use a physical body or virtual mm -hmm. body. Mm. But what your key message you want to present? But uh, uh, for me, um, and the message will um attach to me is about the the relationship of the human about uh, between the humans or the human with uh, with the nature or mm. the universe. Because I think uh, this is very like a philosophy uh, issue. Um. I I think uh, I really I really happy about because I'm I'm designer as well because I'm I'm my training is come from the designer and from the painting, but uh, I practice uh, for a long time in the theater arts and performance arts. Before I'm I'm really fans I'm really fans on the visual, but now maybe during these years i really think about what a key message i want to present to to my audience or to my uh, whatever the reader or something yeah this and also in in the in the 21st century have lots of issue around us it looks very seriously um you know the I think people we live in the digital but uh, you know we also separated each other and for example maybe we're not very focused about my normal life we don't mm. know about our labor we don't care maybe um but if we always always stay in some the virtue because today i really really happy all the performance of all the work and from the all the guests really happy is very very fantastic dialogue from the different views but I also have some critical thinking about our relationships mm -hmm. yeah so this is a maybe I'm a third artist I really I'm, I'm a, <laughs> like the literature like yeah I, I don't know anyway this is just some message from my personal yeah mm -hmm. yeah no, but I think it's very important that message because the, <laughs> Thank human, you. the, 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 human, the human aspect and uh, technology is technology. It is what is yeah. what uh, the physical interaction, you know, and that people talk to each other, and it's kind of like yeah. what yeah, you know, also should should give to the next generation that a uh, person that talk yeah. is a person that talk, and uh, looking to each into each other's eyes yeah. is is, uh, is such a difference compared to all the digital and you know it's great and it will come and we will go to the holodeck but uh, if, if you can if you can give something to the children then technology is a tool and that's uh, that's it yeah. but personal interaction and meeting each i really other agree and, mike i really yeah. agree agree right. so this, so is, this why is why is i so can't important. i can't get your message from your works because you also have some motion about a human this is really yeah. important yeah it's about feelings it's, it's not about machines yeah. so you know it's it's, it's the feeling that uh, yeah, yeah, what, yeah, it's very what, important. What we are discussing now is like also like make me realize the me and Liu Xin and Li Ting we have a discussion like the day before yesterday. We are talking we was talking about like the differences between the po uh, we always like bring one word into our the form is the post digital. So Liu Xin said that the difference between the digital era and the post digital era is the humanity inside. So the the mm -hmm. the like the uh the digital things is like 
only a simple tool for us, or is like we have to consider the humanity chain behind it, or we have to consider the human first, then the, the tech, technology sort of things, and then let the humanity bring bring us to an amazing design rather than the show itself sort of things. Yeah, because when I do when I did some the digital project, I was thinking this digital uh, pieces or digital language will uh, still go ahead around the 3000 years old i mean after 3000 years old because you know when now i still can get my ancient greek script i i can use it because i think why this kind of thing can last him for a long time but i don't know digital language yet. but i really 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 welcome the new language really welcome this new uh, stage, but I still have some yeah critical thinking about uh, hum humanity. Yeah, I think I don't have questions. Yoshin, do you want to say something? Okay, yeah, uh, you have comments. You have comments. Okay, we got a question from our audiences that uh, asking, uh, Yambo, uh, they are asking, uh, because most of our audiences are architects, so they are asking, uh, how uh, can archi how, how do you think uh, architects in the future will create uh, uh, virtual architecture, virtual houses in the uh, metaverse? Uh, it's like uh, to might uh, uh, architectural design a house as an as an NFT. Uh, because at the end of your presentation, you showed a, a collaboration with another artist. Uh, it's like an interior. Um, what do you yeah. think? Yeah, it's an interesting question for sure. Um, so earlier this year, we saw um, an artist called uh, Krista Kim, uh, basically sold an architecture she did on Mars, um, including all the furnitures, um, digitally fully and and... And if I'm not wrong, she allowed the ability to manufacture some of the furnitures in Italy and basically allowing the, um, the person that collected this house uh, to actually create this in, <clears throat> in real life. So I think that the potential of it uh, should be something along those lines. Uh, but the key here is to provide an actual usability for it. Because if, for example, we are selling um, a digital plan for your house, uh, which might include some photorealistic experience or might include only the plan for uh, the architecture. So I, I think right now when we don't have really the ability to use it in a proper way, um, it's almost useless. I mean, you can, you can view all those nice imagery and you can put them on some digital frame. Um, but I think that in the future, when we will have some uh, more immersive uh, way to experience our a virtual home or our visual digital home and then we will be able to basically purchase a design and uh, uh, offer a certain architecture and experience it in in our digital space and uh, this would really make the change uh, about owning all those uh, nfts or digital collectibles or or uh, digital interiors um, I, I think the limitation those days is that we don't really have a way to um, experience those fully. Uh, I mean, imagine the, the moment you can, you can purchase a digital space and you can just go and put your Oculus uh, a VR headset and then right away be inside this uh, shaded uh, house, uh, which is implemented directly to your uh, piece of technology. And... Uh, Whenever uh, who, who would come to your to your home, you can show them your digital space. Um, it would take all this experience to the next level, and this is in some way what uh, we are trying to do. But obviously, the technology is very limiting. Um, but for me, it's about owning the design. I mean, if you purchasing something from a, a, a certain a certain architecture or designer, um, and you own this architecture, um, the ability to to use it in the future would probably evolve and 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 make more sense that that we having those days. So this is just my point of view on this topic. I I, I assume well, that yeah. 
But, but isn't then the internet just becoming, you know, a replica of the real world where it's just about status symbols and about those things just to, I have to purchase something. I mean, like the, the whole web, you know, it was built on, upon this kind of like exchange of information and uh, yeah. building like a structure where we can kind of like communicate easier, uh, exchange information. And uh, through all this NFT and, and building this metaverse, you know, you start to build again your architecture, where you're going to live, where you're going to show off that stuff. And um, I hope that that the kids will come around and just build some stuff and it, it will be there and everybody can use it uh, 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 for free, you know, instead of um, selling, j j j because it's kind of like you, you start selling, selling, I'm going to sell that share, I'm going to sell that. And then it's uh, like, okay, you come to my home, you see I have those design pieces. And um, isn't that the place where everybody can be free and um, not be in, yeah, it's, within it's, those confines, you know? It's 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 a great, it's a great uh, point to raise. I, personally, I think that the whole idea of supporting artists directly, because, for example, what we're trying to do is directly to allow the support to the artist, not not by uh, making it into a certain brand that will uh, sell those things, but having the ability to connect the collectors from the artist directly. I, I truly believe that people that spend most of their lives into a certain thing uh, should probably re reward for, for all the artwork. Uh, I mean, people in the, our indus industry currently owning money by working uh, in studios or, or be, be, being freelancers or just providing uh, solutions for brands or or you know different type of, of uh, media publishers um, and for me this whole change and shift for people be able to create their practice and their own art and having people that that want to basically own this specific design or this specific collectible or this specific architecture house i mean what, what is the different uh, I mean, the difference is huge, but I'm just asking it for the sake of the, the explanation. What is the difference between owning a, a physical architecture design to a digital architect, ar architecture design? I, I think the, the difference is the experience. I mean, in the real world, you can obviously experience it every day by living in this space and you can show it to everyone around you. In the digital space, it's pretty much limited. And I, I believe that the moment we will have like more usage for um, the digital space, um, the ownership of the assets and, and basically purchasing um, artwork directly for those artists is just a way to support people that didn't show any possibility to earn money besides studio work and being freelancer till those days. So I just I, I believe yeah, sure, it's sure, sure. But you know, the list, the list is long of people that we need to support. You know, it's kind of like uh, third world countries, uh, kind of like people working in public services and, and stuff like this. Yeah. So this is it's a really, it's a really huge field where we have to support people and uh, take care of them. Basically. Yeah, I, I mean, you don't have to. I think the beautiful thing is that if a certain collector would like to, to buy something from a certain artist because they really love his work. This is the beauty about it. And I think that the incentive is exactly like the incentive in the physical life and, and what art collectors did for hundreds of years, if not thousand, I don't really know the, 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 the facts of the history, but this is something that been in our culture for so long. Uh, you know, buying something for a certain artist and, and the, 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 the whole Technology of the NFT only allowing the the proof of ownership. I think this is the key uh, thing behind it because if you want to buy something from Mike, you can basically see that Mike minted it from his wallet on this or other platform and just own his work because you want to support him and you and you love his work. For me, this is the most beautiful uh, concept about NFTs and not uh, specifically about money, but about uh, providing artists a new way to generate income. Uh, in in a very like honest way about their art, I mean there is no, a lot sure, of for sure it's it's a it's a it's a great it's a great, it's a great concept you know I'm, I'm completely I'm completely with the concept because I love it um, it just has some certain limitations to today so I think yeah but but, but, but will, I, oh, at the same time visible, at the same time I I totally agree with a lot of your points I I feel that there is a lot of like wrong things happening in the field of NFTs and there is a lot of like things that j just doesn't make sense you know when when you see like a random artwork uh, felt for uh, so much money, you know, we saw prices of NFTs. It's really doubting you about like the quality of the art and, uh, and the, 
you know, it, 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 it's such a big problem, you know, just Elon Musk's tweets, uh, one tweet and he yeah. can, you know, where, where you, you, you were saying like working against like the Silicon Valley and I'm completely all for it, you know, but the single individual can just with one tweet can kind of like manipulate the, the whole, the, the whole That's stock of, of, of the cryptocurrency, you know, so and it, it becomes immediately kind of a, such a tool for the rich to to make themselves more rich you know so it's it's that's that's where i'm just a bit uh, wary basically I, I can't agree more about this topic you know i think that um specifically what you mentioned about elon musk is doing a lot of uh, innovative and amazing things where at the same time um this all like mem Do dogecoin kind of things is yeah. is beautiful with the idea of having so many people going after a single person but at the same time um i, I don't want to say that this is probably for his own benefit, but I assume that there is uh, some, yeah, exactly. I assume that there is some uh, personal benefit from all those stuff. So it's a very complex topic. And, and I feel that it it's, it's also very sensitive because, um, you know, you, you probably did a lot of conversation with colleagues in this industry, like we all did while watching this, uh, this whole shift in the world. And basically what I'm at least trying to do, I'm not sure if it will work well, but just trying to put a bit more sense about uh, at least the usability of those assets, even if just by allowing downloading specific assets side to the MP4 that is pretty much useless besides showing case, casing it and, and all of the, the rest of the stuff that we discussed. So yeah, it's, it's, it's very complex topic and I think that we'll just learn as the time passes. but it's definitely an interesting field to explore, at least I feel that way. <laughs> Definitely. Yes, I, I think that is a very amazing idea. Yeah, I, yeah, I think... I think so far the the uh, the whole NFT ecosystem is more like a financial thing. But in the future, uh, when the technology development of the mixed reality is so sophisticated, uh, probably in near future, like two or three years, uh, we will be living in a world that the digital and the physical are finally fusing together. Uh, it's like uh, the the earth, the whole earth uh, has multiple layers, uh, which is uh, which contains the the, the physical layer, uh, the tangible one, which is our uh, real world, and the uh, virtual multiple virtual layers uh, provided by the uh, this kind of digital uh, digital objects, digital space. Uh, so at that time. Uh, those digital collectibles will uh, really have the social value uh, in, in, addition, uh, in addition to solely the, uh, uh, the financial value. So it's, it will be more like, uh, it will be more about experience instead of a financial thing, I think. And actually yeah, we have, I, uh, we have a, a specific like about NFT metaverse forum on the on Saturday. And uh, we also welcome uh, those people who have interested in our metaverse topic and uh, come to listen to us on the Saturday afternoon, 2 p.m. Do you want to say something? Uh, it's um, actually we have four hours meeting right now, so we will have the last question, then we can finish our uh, round table. Okay, yeah, anyone have the last question? Uh, actually, I have one to the Yao. Uh, I see in your work, uh, there are a lot of like uh, street scan stuff. Uh, and you call it digital virtual photography. Uh, actually, uh, I, I, I take my own uh, photo as a 3D scan, a 3D scan image. So how did you start to work with uh, 3D scanning? Uh, because in my point of view, 3D scanning is more like a, a twin of our physical world. It's like a uh, a digital twin of the physical world, but with different resolution, because the physical world is always analog uh, and continuous, but the digital is discrete, uh, and it always come, it always, uh, it should always dealing with the issue of resolution. 就是我的问题是, 
，呃，我看到在你的作品里有很多三维扫描的东西，呃，其实就在我看来，这个三维扫描它它本质上，呃呃，是现实世界的一个数字孪生，呃，它就像摄影一样。在一百年前，摄影呃一一百五十年前，摄影术刚被发明的时候，那个时候人们通过，呃化学反应的方式，将空间中的光子投射到一个化学材料上，也就是胶片上，或者那个时候是用那种玻璃，然后呃再通过化学手段把它洗印出来，最后印在一张纸上，就最后它是在一张纸上作为一个媒介来呈现的。那现在其实这个三维扫描本质上就是把空间中的光子，呃，用用三维的方式记录在呃一种媒介上。那现在记录的媒介是数字空间，也就是说这些像素它是以三维的方式分布在这样一个数字空间中的。所以，呃，我看到就是你之前说，就是你是在做这种数字虚拟摄影，呃，我觉得还是。非常呃，和这个主题相匹配的，它它也是其实连接了这个物理世界与虚拟世界。所以我想问的就是，你最开始是怎么样去呃接触到三维扫描？怎么样呃开始用不同的方式去用三维扫描这项技术来表达作品的？比如说，在你的最开始呃许魏洲的那个杂志大片，还有后来有一些。就像是画廊里，就是那种很酸性的呃物体构成，就是想想让你讲讲和围绕着三维扫描的这个过程。对，嗯，围围绕着三维扫描的话，就其实嗯，包括之前做的一些酸性物体一些设计，它其实嗯。都可能是对我来说，我可能是比较喜欢它，就是酸性设计的一些那种结结构和一些机理上的一些质感，它是，嗯，有一些这种，嗯，觉得是有一些损坏或者一些这种分裂、分离感的一些这种，嗯，不确定性。包括我去接触 3D 扫描的时候，也能发觉到，就是它在。去扫描的过程中，其实是会有很多这种很很漏黑的一些漏拍的一些破面，这种对，嗯嗯 ，at first， 嗯 ，he was 呃、uh, really interesting in the IC IC design， 嗯、um, ，in IC design he finds there's lots of imperfection， like there's lots of、uh, randomness， 嗯、um, ，when the first time he saw the 3D scan he He found the same feature.、Uh, it's the 3D scan also has a、uh, the same feature, the randomness in the imperfect in the the imperfection. Um, uh, yeah, uh, some there are still lots of broken parts、uh, in the 3D scan. 对，包括嗯，我我之之后现在一直在做的一些植物系列的话，它也是去用了很多一些三维扫描的一些去。嗯，去收集一些可能周围的一些植物、一些花草之类的，它可能是聚聚聚在和我现在去做的一些这种植物去相叫做一个融合吧。对，可能它其实也是一直在，对，它一直是在帮助我去再去建立我的一个对数数字资源库的一样。呃、uh, ，including the project he's doing now, the plants, um, the series, um, uh, with the plants. Um, he also used 3D scan to scan、uh, lots of span,、uh, lots of plants around him, like the flowers and grasses, and then the grass.、Um, so, so the 3D scan also helped him to build、um, his own assets, and、uh, it's like a collection、uh, for him. It's also helped him his、uh, like new. Okay, that, that's all. Thank you. Okay, 我还有一个问题，你当时在扫描许魏洲的时候，我看到你用的那种扫描仪，它会发射激光。那，呃，作为艺人，他，他，他，他是很能接受这样的拍摄方式吗？因为大部分时尚杂志拍摄的时候还是就是普通的那种照相机拍摄嘛。呃、uh, ，So my question is, uh, 
you collaborated with the Wonderland magazine to shoot a fashion virtual photography uh, for a uh, for like a Chinese celebrity called it Xu Weizhou. So my question is, when you are shooting with this uh, celebrity, um, did he feel comfortable with such 3D scanning method compared with uh, traditional photography? Yes. 对，但我们可能会去做一些前期的沟通，包括去用一些就是，嗯，之前做的一些效果，或者是一些来去跟他做一些这种，嗯，很详细的一些沟通。因因为就是很多艺人是会建议这方面的一些，就是，嗯，在执行方面的一些，对，就是，嗯，方式嘛。所以，但但是他其实，嗯，在我们经过沟通之后，他也是能去。就是完全配合百分之百配合我们这个工作，对，所以就他其实还蛮配合。呃， uh, for this talent， 呃，嗯， he's basically， 嗯、um, ， communicate with the talent for the celebrities and the talent team before， and the show explain this how the 3D scan works and show him， 呃、um, ， the work， 呃， has done， 呃， by using 3D scan before。So, um, for for this talent, he really understood, uh, uh, what he's doing, and I really understand the projects very well. Yeah. So everything goes uh like smoothly. Okay. Uh, thank you. I think I got it. Thank you. Right. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. I think now we're free discussion. Uh, is over right now. And uh, thanks again so much to Mike, Yambo, Wang Jing, Yang, Liu Xing, Koyola, and Louis. You gave us unbelievable, amazing presentation, and uh, we have a really deep conversation. Uh, we talked a lot about the post-digital design methods, your unique manipulations with digital and the physical tools assets, and um, and it's a really great and big topic about the metaverse and the NFT. Uh, unfortunately, we do not have much time to talk about that, but I think next time we'll have uh, another, maybe we'll have another seminar to talk about that 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 kind of like uh, futuristic things. Yeah, and uh, thank you. And thanks again to our volunteers who help us to do streaming tonight. And uh, we have over 13,000 audience join us tonight. And actually right now it's over 12 a.m. right now in China. And there are still over 3,000 audience with us. And so our Chinese students are very, very uh, interested in our event and they love your works so much. So um, I really want you to know that our uh, audience love you so much. And thanks again to everyone. Um, I think it is over right now. <laughs> and uh, my my say thank, thank you, you to Liu Xing, Yu Ting, and Hu Pong, and also all mm -hmm. the volunteers and uh, all the guests. Thank you so much for the wonderful uh, the dialogue and with the different perspective. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Thank you, guys.